afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm just trying to get uh, the hair out of my eyes because I can't see this afternoon. And you can see we've got a new character with us. It's Chewbacca's cousin. So I'm going to do a little drive. And, uh, well, it's great to have you here today. And the funny thing about Chewbacca's cousin... This is obviously Taylor talking right now, but we're going to go to Chewbacca's cousin now. What's Chewbacca's cousin's name? We forgot to meet Rufus, but it's a girl, Rufalina. Oh, gosh, I'm losing the plot. Oh, oh my, everything is... There you go. David? That's perfect. Is that fine? Yeah. Right. It's so lovely to see you all this, uh, this afternoon. It's it's quite chilly out here today. Sorry. <laughs> I can't be serious. Obviously, it's not Chewbacca. I'm here. I've just got a ridiculous amount of hair. I'm wearing two hats, <laughs> four eyes, thanks to Reese. And, well, it's so great to be back in the vehicle, David. We don't want to lose this. Now... It feels like, I always say this, every time I have an afternoon or a morning off or something like that, it's quite ridiculous. It feels as though I haven't driven in such a long time. But it's great to have you here. Now, you know you're watching the pre-drive drive, and we'll give you a little tip. If you're worried that you're perhaps going to miss the show at any point, you can actually subscribe to the page. There's a little bell that you click, and every time we go live for the pre-drive drive, you get a little notification. And, well, I love the pre-drive drive. It's actually my favorite thing, one of my favorite things about the show of course is because we get to be a little bit more silly than what we normally are and well I don't think I'm a very I'm not particularly a serious person but yes yeah, so David <clears throat> what are we going to do today I see David's on camera with me this afternoon find a leopard oh, yes. David says we're going to go and find a leopard so I think what we will try and do is we'll most likely go and have a look for Tingana now I don't know where he was this morning but I did hear him late last night giving off a call and I think he's gone a bit further north so we'll have a look around maybe Buffalo's Hook Dam side maybe check Cheetah Catline and all those ways we know sometimes he, he afterwards he'll go into torture and he, he does these big loops let's hope he hasn't though of course now <clears throat> that's going on here David, what song should we sing? Because I feel like singing. I've got lots of energy this afternoon. Mm. Pressure's on. What about um, Dancing in the Rain? Dancing in the Rain. How's it go? Dancing in the Rain. That's why David's <laughs> not into, into music. Okay, no, David, I know that song. May, no, I don't. Should we just make up a song about the schools that are coming to join us this afternoon? So we're doing a couple of school drives. So I remember all three of them. We've got Malibu Elementary. We've got Glenwood Elementary. And we've got North Landing joining us this afternoon. And they're all of various ages, and I'm sure they'll be very, very excited to join us. So that's going to be fun. They should be joining us at the start of the show. And, uh, well, it's just fantastic to be out here this afternoon. I really want to sing or rap or something, but I just, I'm trying to think of lyrics and nothing's coming to mind. Louise, you're really good at rapping. Do you have any tips for me? Louise wasn't paying any attention to me for a moment. Louise, I wanted to know if you're good at rapping or if you could give me a line to just start off with. No response. Yes, putting in. Oh, oh my goodness. So, <laughs> so Louise's one was, what? It's 30 seconds to Safari Live. Go and find us some beehives. That's that's all right. It's not bad. I'll have to think of one, though. So give me a bit of time. But we'll, we'll come up with one, though. I think we'll come up with a good rap. I'll have to resort to getting out my notebook, though, and writing a couple of key lyrics down. I think that that's going to have to be the case today. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be very exciting. Now... I'm going to say goodbye, but I'm sure you'll come back to me at some point because I've got something cool to show you. But I'll see you in a little bit. This program features live coverage of an African safari.
content may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to the middle of the African bush. You can see there's a lion walking behind myself and Jandre. This is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Greater Kruger National Park, South Africa. My name is Brent and I have got Jandre on camera. And of course, we are with the Inkahuma Pride who have had a busy day. They've managed to kill not one, but two buffalo during the day. And this lioness was just chasing some vultures off the second carcass. The rest of the pride, or not all the pride. And they are going to, she's going to lead us right back to them. And a very big welcome to Glenwood North Landing and Malibu Schools. Uh, this is your game drive live from the African bush. So please send me questions about these incredible cats we're about to see. I'd love to hear from you. Or if any other questions you have about the African bush, uh, we'll do, we will do our best to answer them for you. Now, we've got a bit of a lion traffic jam at the moment. There we go. Look at that. Now, sorry guys, I just see on the Game Drive channel, so there's lots of different people out here. Go just to let anyone know, uh, it's Brent Wild Earth who's in the Nkoma sighting. Okay. Here we go, look what's coming up around the corner. It's a big male lion, a, a beautiful beast in its prime. Like there we go, and there's a, a little cub lying down in the... And there's oh, the rest of the pride feeding. Let's have a look. Now, this is a buffalo cow that they've managed to kill. And here we go. Look at all of them. No more than six feet from us, feasting upon their midday snack. There's two little cubs there, just under six months old, still feeding. Look, 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 another lioness has just arrived and she's greeting the male. Our lions are the only truly social cat and all these little greeting ceremonies are very important. Hey, look at that. Now do it this way. Turn around, mister. What he was doing there, you saw him baring his teeth there like that. It's called a Fleming grimace. Now, that Fleming grimace is what happens when he smells a female's urine. And it is one of their ways of communicating. So he can k pick up from the urine when she's ready to mate, when she's going to be an estrus. Now, Mrs. Daniels, hi, Mrs. Daniels, is wondering why are the lions completely ignoring the jeep? <coughs> Having a bit of a fight, the little ones. Now, a jeep, a lion, oh, wait, listen to that. <coughs> Oh, is the argument over? Now, 
the lines, these particular lines, have grown up with vehicles around them, and lines don't have an instinctual response to a car. These the cars have only been around for about a hundred years. So if you drive carefully and considerately, and you don't push their boundaries, they completely ignore the vehicles, as you can see, and carry on with what they would do naturally. And that's one of the amazing things about being out here. We are able to witness all these incredible different interactions between the various animals that live here in the Greater Kruger National Park. Look at that. So as sad as it is to see a dead buffalo without the buffalo dying, there'd be no food for those little lion cubs. Now, of course, there used to be eight little lion cubs, but we'll go into a bit more depth later. So yeah, I didn't quite hear that. Valora was asking why are the lions so big? Big. Now, Aurora. Aurora, sorry, Aurora. Aurora wants to know why are the lions so big? Well, they gotta be big so they can catch big things like that buffalo. Uh, and of course, if they got a very fat belly, they're just big because they've been eating too much buffalo. But they have to be big enough to fill their niche in the ecosystem, so they're the apex predator which means they are the top predator out here and they have to be big because they eat big things is the the best answer I can give you there Aurora oh what she got there now of course jean and I are not the only people out here in the African bush looking for animals so let's go meet Taylor. Good afternoon, and in, like I said in the pre-drive drive, I said I had a little surprise, and well, here it is. We're looking at a ginormous hippopotamus, and the fact that he's out all on his own, and by the size of his head and the rest of his body, this must be a boy. He's a big boy. You can also see that there's a couple of birds hopping around on him. But before I get into too much detail, I suppose I better say hello. Now, my name is Taylor, of course, and on camera with me this afternoon, we've got David. Let's take another look at this incredible animal. Now, we're very lucky to be seeing a hippo out of the water because normally they spend most of their days trying to keep away from the hot sun. So they'll lie around in water, preferably, but if there's no water, They'll settle for some mud. But because it's a nice cloudy day today here in South Africa, he's taken advantage of this cool day and the fact that the sun isn't out belting down on him. And he's out munching some grass. That's incredible that an animal of this size just feeds on grass. And normally they only come out at night to, of course, eat the grass, but luckily, He's got the cool weather on his side. Now there's quite a few different species of birds that are climbing on him. You can see the red-billed oxpeckers dangling from his legs. And that bright bird that was in front of his face that has now run away is a Cape Glossy Starling. There it is. And what they're doing is these little blue birds are picking up all the insects. As the hippo moves through the grass, is kicking up lots of little insects. And the oxpeckers, the ones that were dangling off of its body, well, they're feeding on the ticks, the parasites that eat and feed on the t hippo's blood. There's one. But they also seem to be a little bit cold this afternoon. Now, I'd love to hear from all of you, so if you've got any questions for me, you're welcome to send them through to your teachers. Now, Mia, you're wondering how much does a hippopotamus weigh? Now, I'm going to do a bit of a conversion, of course, but they can weigh sort of, I would say, about four and a half thousand pounds, not too much more than that. They're quite large, and he's really big. Now, I don't think he's going to get any bigger. He looks like a fully grown hippo. And would you believe, Mia, if I told you that this hippopotamus could, can run very, very, very fast? even though he's got the shortest little legs I've ever seen on any animal, especially for the size of his body. 
they can run up to about 30 kilometers an hour. David, I don't, well, do you know what the conversion is in miles? I keep forgetting. I'm not sure, and my maths is not very good, unfortunately, so I'll just have to leave it at that. But it's quicker than you and I could run. And I reckon that Usain Bolt could maybe outrun him for about 10 seconds, and well, then he may be in a bit of trouble too. This hippopotamus will probably catch up to him in the end. But look at it, look how big he is now that he comes out. You can just see the pure muscle around his neck, under his shoulders. Now, Aiden, you're wondering why hippos have such big teeth. Now, we know that they just eat grass, so they don't use them to catch any animals. The males have got massive teeth, and the reason for this is for fighting and for protection. So when the boys fight over the groups of the ladies, we call the, the, her, or the herds of hippos, the, the groups of hippos, a pod, and they will battle it out, and they will open their mouths. Often they open their mouths first to expose those big teeth, saying, look how big and strong I am. And if... There's one hippo that's smaller than the opposing boy. Well then, they'll probably move away and realize that he's going to bite off too much and he can sort of chew and he'll go off and on his way. But if they're of even size, they will then move towards each other, open their mouths and start biting away. Now though, even though they've got quite thick skin, those teeth can do a lot of damage. Now, Seamus, you're wondering why hippos are so fat. Now, I've been very lucky. Oh, there was a hippo that unfortunately died due to the drought conditions. This was about a couple of months ago. And they opened it up. They did an autopsy. So we got to see the organs and we got to see all these incredible things, the different parasites that live in the different parts of the stomach. It was really amazing. But one thing that I found particularly incredible was how much skin and how much fat that a hippo actually has on it. So... Not, not as much fat as what you think, very, very thin layer, but the skin was probably about that thick, probably equated to almost five centimeters or so, so really, really thick. So they have that protection, that thick skin. They obviously need to try and keep themselves warm during the day. They use the sun, but remember, they live in water for most of the time, and the rest of their skin is really thick. But the epidermis, so the top layer of your skin, the first layer, is really thin. It's only a couple of millimeters thin. Now, that's actually quite easy to penetrate. So you could even take a, a stick or something and you could cut the hippo quite easily. But luckily for this hippopotamus is that they've got the secretion that they release through all of their pores in their body called hippo sudoric acid, or you can call it blood sweat. And in that, it has an antiseptic as well as a mild sunblock. So that's how the hippo protects itself. Remember I told you that those boys like to fight and they can cut each other open quite easily? Sometimes when you see them, you sit and you think, oh, that's so terrible. But they heal so quickly because of that antiseptic that they have inside of that hippo blood sweat. Now, this unfortunately, the hippo is now disappearing down into the drainage. It's not just Brent and I. James is on foot and he would love to say hello to you. Good afternoon everybody from Malibu, Glenwood and Heartland Elementary Schools. I hope you're having a wonderful time here in Africa with us on Safari. My name is James, on camera today is Brian and Brian's thumb. In fact, he has both thumbs with him, but only one of them is, uh, <laughs> sorry, that is <laughs> North Landing, not Heartland. I'm sorry about that. Heartland's quite a good name though, really, don't you think? Now, we've stopped here for a very special reason. This bush is a whole ecosystem on its own. Now, I don't know if you know what an ecosystem is, but basically, it's everything in a piece of earth that is both living and unliving. Uh, so it would be the soil and the stones and the rocks and that sort of thing, and then the trees and then all the things that eat the trees and the grasses and that sort of thing. But every little bush like this is an ecosystem unto itself. Now here, we have a bush and we have a whole lot of beetles. There's a very interesting example of one. And I'll pick one off the plant now to show you. And what the beetles are eating, it seems like they're eating the sap of the tree. And then once we've seen the beetle, there's one of them there. They're a beautiful copper color. Now you can see one. And that beautiful copper color 
shining and makes them look like little pieces of fruit really. <laughs> Alex, while we look at these beetles, it's a very good question you ask. How many animals do we have here? Alex, it's impossible to say, you know, because we can vaguely tell how many impala there are, or how many hippos, or how many elephants how many elephants and lions, how many beetles are there? Beetles are also animals. These things that I've got in my hand here, uh, this disgusting looking worm, this is also an animal, believe it or not. And so it's impossible to say how many animals there are. There are millions and millions of wasps and beetles and mantises and grasshoppers and flies and bees and wasps and various other things. I said wasps twice there, sorry about that. And this is the grub or love form of dung beetle. So this is dung. Of course, to watch that. Moan and Pumba and Simba were moving around through the bush on their own, and they were eating little worms and things. This is the kind of thing they were eating, and a human being eat these delicious stuff. Right, we're going to get a little bit further away. We've got better signal. Let's get across to the Philippines. Welcome back, everyone. We're still sitting here with the incredible Inkahuma pride and uh, the adult lionesses. Look at that. So even though lions are incredibly social and friendly to each other, when it comes to dinner, they can be very, very nasty to each other. They don't have good table manners. Now, guys, I know this is quite sensitive, but this is nature, and this happens every day out here in the African bush. So just a warning that sometimes, especially when lions are feeding on something, it might become a little bit graphic. Okay. Let's have a look. We're gonna. We're not gonna stay here too long. We weren't gonna see what else we can find. And there are other game drive cars that want to come see these lions as well. Now, Dirk is wondering how many lions live in this park. Dirk. Well, in the Greater Kruger itself, uh, the, the whole population is estimated to be bet between 1,500 and 2,000. I'm sorry, yeah, around there, that's the, the estimate for the whole park. Uh, in our little section of the park, we've probably got about uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 20 or so. Uh, but it, it varies, and they move in and out of our area quite regularly. Callie's wondering, do most lions eat buffalo? Now, that one's got stomach content all over its face. She's trying to eat the stomach lining. Of course, she's not going to eat what's inside the tummy because that's grass, and lions don't eat grass. There we go. Now, Callie was asking, do all lions eat buffalo? Uh, well, if they get the opportunity to. Generally, generally it's quite difficult uh, for a single lion or female lion to bring down a buffalo, but as a, a pride, they do eat a lot of buffalo. Well, this pride in particular specializes in buffalo, and it's the food they eat the most. Now, Hannah's wondering, will the lions eat the whole buffalo? Hannah, it, it, they'll eat most of the buffalo. They're not going to be able to eat the skull or the brain casing. It's, it's really, really hard. And the big, bo big, big bones in the legs, the spine, and the ribs, they're not going to eat that. But almost all the meat they'll try to take off. Okay, well, let's have a look at the one cub who's suckling from its mother. There we go, so he's been eating buffalo and now he's drinking milk. Now 
Now, Colin's wondering, do lions hunt in packs? Indeed, they do, Colin, except they're not called packs. They're called prides, and they're made up of related females. So all the adult females in a pride will be related, and uh, there'll be moms, aunties, sisters, un oh, no uncles, <laughs> but uh, male lions will come from different areas, and like the big guy who's lying in the road over there, so he's a Birmingham boy, so he's come from about 40, 50 kilometers from here. And that's how lions keep their genetics good, is that the related females stay together, but uh, males change every four or five years, and that's to stop inbreeding. Now these are happy looking cubs, big fat bellies. Okay, well, I think we're going to go see what else we can find out in the African bush. We'll leave the lions and let someone else come have a chance to look at them. So while we move out of this area, let's go see what Taylor's up to. Trying to now is you know, Ghana. Now he hasn't been on the property for quite some time. These leopards have territories, so we know that when he comes around here, he's probably going to hang around for a couple of days and go through the pathways that he likes to walk and remark his territories. I mean, so I'm just very quickly turning down the radio, and uh, that's who we're looking for. Now, what I have to do to try and find him, so I don't think he was seen this morning, is I've got to look for his footprints. So as the animals are walking on these roads, well, they leave their footprints behind, but it depends on, of course, the quality of the road. So if it's nice and sandy, that helps us because the ground is a lot softer. This road is not the greatest road because it's quite hard, so it makes it quite difficult to, of course, see their footprints. But, oh, who have we got here? Let's see if, anyone, if they're going to sit behind. Let me go back a little bit. There are two little birds sitting on a tree. No, they're not staying, hey, David? Can you see them flapping around there? Now we saw the cousin of this bird earlier with the hippopotamus. We saw the Cape Glossy Starling. Now we saw, saw the bigger Starling, which was the Birchall Starling. But they don't want to hang around today, but that's okay. Are they still there, David? Oh, there they are, hiding in the distance. And it's a pity that there isn't much sun today, because they've got beautiful iridescent feathers. Now, Jackson, you were wondering about the birds that sat on the big hippopotamus that we saw. Now, you're wondering why do they do that? And that's because those oxpeckers, the red-billed oxpeckers, physically remove the parasites that are feeding on the blood of the hippopotamus. So those are called ticks. And you know, I'm sure you know ticks and fleas. Sometimes your cats and dogs can get them at home. That's what they like to eat. Let's carry on. There's a couple of birds shouting around. Let's see if we can see who they are. But we are making our way towards Bivelshook Dam. Apparently, to Ghana. There may be footprints in the mud. Okay, we'll carry on. On top of that termite mound, on the trees that are growing on the termite mound. Do you see that? Look how beautiful they are. These are called magpie shrikes. And you can see they've got beautiful long tails. They're one of the few birds that have these lovely long tails. What we often see is normally during the breeding season for the boys, they get these beautiful long additional feathers and often a long tail feather. But both the male and the female have the tail feathers. But isn't that lovely? Now they're sitting there waiting for some insects to start moving around, maybe some caterpillars or grasshoppers. But we're going to start heading down towards Bivol's Hook Dam and see if there's anything there. But let's go back across to James and see if he's found anything interesting. Mmm. How delicious, everybody. Do you know what this is? This, everyone, is elephant dung. Now, many of you, of course, will be disgusted by the fact that I've picked up any kind of dung at all, and that is completely normal. 
and in fact it's a good idea. You shouldn't really pick up dung unless you know exactly where it's come from and I know where this has come from. It's come from an elephant and elephant dung if it's about a week and a half to two weeks old smells delicious. It's just like spices. It's like smelling a whole a sort of mix of delicious spices. Mmm, lovely. Now, Kelly, you want to know what the most common bug is around here. I would say, well, remember, there are two things to that question, Kelly. A bug is a specific kind of, in, of an insect, like a beetle. So you can't call a beetle a bug and you can't call a fly a bug. But the most common kind of insect out here is probably the mosquito. So there are lots and lots of different mosquitoes around here. There are also lots and lots of flies because lots of things die out here every so often. You know, that's just what happens in nature. And the flies of course eat all of those things. Now let's just go over here I'll tell you why. Just walking in front of us there is Herbert. Now Herbert is a very very fine tracker indeed and he has said that we must come over here because he's going to find us something I think. And Herbert grew up in this area so he knows absolutely everything there is to know about the plants and about the animals out here and about finding things. Oh, look what Herbert's found, everybody. <laughs> Jordan, you say, how come we are not afraid out here? Jordan, the reason we are not afraid out here is because we have, first of all, someone like Herbert looking after us, and also because we've got lots of experience here. Now, if you imagine, there are two things I'm going to show you here. First of all, this rather terrifying beetle. Now, this is a beetle, not a bug, and we know that because it's got a specific kind of what we call elytra. So these wings have been fused or made hard to protect the wings underneath. So we know that this is a beetle, and look at those vicious, vicious jaws that it's got that it uses to defend itself. Isn't that a vicious beetle? So you can tell that this is probably some kind of uh, biting beetle, some kind of beetle that eats other things. And Aiden, you want to know if this could hurt us. Yes, Aiden, this beetle could probably give you a bit of a bite. I don't think it would hurt you, but it would certainly make you go, ow! So we're not scared, everybody, because we've been trained. Now, it's exactly the same thing as if perhaps, imagine that you grew up on a farm and you'd never seen a vehicle before. And then you went to town and suddenly you were surrounded to New York City and suddenly you were surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of cars going up and down and taxis and buses and trains and planes and people. You'd be very scared indeed. But out here, of course, it's the same thing. If you have come from a city and you come and work in a place like this, you start off being quite scared, but you get used to it. You get used to what the dangers are and you become, to, you become able to learn what's going on here. Now, there's one other thing I want to show you here. And the colour is quite spectacular. Oh, but I've lost it. Oh no. It was gorgeous. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous little piece of uh, an animal that this beetle ate, I think. Eric, while we're looking for it, you want to know... Uh, what, what does he want to know again? Oh, do we always pick up elephant dung? No, not always. Just when I really want to smell something delicious. There's the jaws of another one of these beetles. And I'm just wondering what has killed them. And things like scorpions will eat these beetles, I suppose. They could be birds as well would eat them. But you see, a bird would swallow the whole thing. So I don't know what's killed this fellow. He looks pretty fearsome. Anyway, that's the story here. We're going to continue moving now and see what else we can find while we're on foot. And the idea behind our bushwalk here is to look for the small things. We might see some big stuff like buffalo and elephant, but we'll probably try and avoid them and we'll just look for little things, tracks and birds and that sort of thing. Now, on the subject of birds, Taylor's got a very special tall bird to show you. Now we've got this beautiful woolly neck stork, but Brent is just trying to get hold of me. Brent, can you stand by for just two minutes? Um, so just quickly chatting to Brent, Brent's trying to get hold of me, but I'll have a chat with him now. So we've got this beautiful woolly neck stork that's sitting up on the tree. There was actually another one, possibly a pair of them. We've seen them come through over the last couple of weeks. And I suspect I know why they're hanging around in this area. And that's because, unfortunately, 
a buffalo died almost two weeks ago because of the drought. Now he's died around the corner and sometimes these woolly neck stalks will actually feed on the carcass. It's not very common but it is it, it, it has been recorded before and also there'll probably be lots of other insects and little crustaceans because we're here at, at Buffalo's Hook Dam. I actually want to show you what this beautiful dam looks like. Have a look at this. They like to hang around these areas but it's so nice to see that woolly neck stalk. Like James said it's not a bird that you see every single day but unfortunately nothing has come down to drink at the water but it's very hot today and there's lots of little watering holes oh there it goes nice catch there David we'll see where it lands is it just going on top okay let's go around the corner then now Aiden you want to know how many different types of birds do we have in, in South Africa? There's about 850 odd different bird species, which is quite a lot. There's a little gap. There's the, the stalk just in the distance. Now, that's quite a lot of birds. Now, I've probably only just seen just shy of about 400 birds, so I've still got a long way to go. And it takes quite some time and, and you have to look very, very carefully if you want to try and find all the small birds. We call the little birds little brown jobs or LBJs because they all look the same. Now I'm just going to, going to move out the way. There's a gentleman that would like to come past me. See, it's not just us out here driving around. There's actually lots of people coming on a safari. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll quickly sneak around and see if we can get one more look. Now, we're not going to go too close to that buffalo carcass, so it doesn't seem like too many things have been eating it, which is not, which is not great for us, unfortunately, because now it's free. Now, Mrs. Coffin, you are wondering if there's a camp, a lodge, sort of, of people where people can come and stay on safaris. You're quite correct. There are indeed. There are many different places out here. We're in the Sabi sand of uh, South Africa, which is a big wilderness area. And there's probably about 35 different lodges. Well, how incredible is that? So you can come and stay at any one of those. Now, isn't that incredible? What we're going to do now is we're going to say goodbye to these birds. And I think James has got something interesting to show you. Now this is something everybody that some birds are able to eat and some birds are not able to eat and it's called a millipede and it's got itself into a little bit of a ball because it's very afraid of me and Brian. Mostly Brian of course because he is six feet and four inches tall so it's very terrifying indeed. Now milli means thousand, pede means foot so it's got supposed to be about a thousand feet. Now that's not quite true it's probably got about three or four hundred different feet but that's just it's just called a millipede. And it's from a different sort. It's not an insect. It ca definitely cannot be called a bug. It's from a great big group of insects called, not insects, of invertebrates called Myriapoda. Now I'll just turn it over for you. The reason I don't want to touch it with my hands is that it has cyanide in the skin. Now cyanide is a very bad poison. It's not enough to hurt us at all, but it's enough to make it defensive for birds. So birds often don't eat these because of the cyanide, but one bird that uses the cyanide is something called a hornbill. And hopefully we'll be able to show you a hornbill. You've all seen the Lion King and you've seen Zazu. Zazu was a hornbill. They use these in their nests. Kemaya, are you worried that if we are bitten by a bug, we might not have the right sort of medicine out here? Kemaya, there are very, very, very few uh, invertebrates or insects that can bite us and cause any harm at all. One, I suppose, would be a centipede, which means 100 foot. That's also a different group of uh, invertebrate animals like this one. They can give you a bit of a sting, but not enough to really create a great trouble. There are only three spiders out here that are dangerous to human beings. One is called a violin spider, the other is called a crab spider, and the other is called a button spider. And other than that, you know, there's, there are very few that can cause trouble unless, like Brian, you're allergic to bees. Now, bees, of course, can give you a sting and then you have to have medicine. But for the others, you know, mostly everything's okay. Bees and scorpions are the two things that you'd have to watch out for if you are out here with no form of medical care. But we've got a little first aid kit with us and we're never too far away from help. So it wouldn't be a problem for us. All right. question 
you be I roll up like this. Ben. Okay, so we've left the lines. We're going to help Taylor search for Tingana. So we're now down in the eastern section of Juma. We're heading right towards our eastern boundary and we're going to start moving towards the south. Now we've had some fantastic sightings over the last couple of years in this area. So who knows, maybe today is going to be another one of those days. Remember, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to ask us any questions. Okay, and keep peering into the bush and as it gets greener and we get more rain it does make spotting animals a little bit more difficult but it is so lovely and green and beautiful and the clouds oh, I wonder if we're gonna get some rain later on this evening and you can see a dark and ominous sky cold and windy weather and that's probably why the Nkohumas had such a successful hunting day uh, Derek, hello Derek. Derek is wondering what other animals in the cat family live here. Well, Derek, we've got other big cats, cheetah and leopard. Then we've got some small cats, uh, African wildcat, caracal and serval. And yep, that's all the cats we get here. Uh, quite, a, quite a few different cats if you think about it. Uh, we've got the fastest cat on top of the termite mountain, Jandre. There we go, spotted a bird. Here we go. Uh, what is that one? Who knows? Uh, is it? Oh, look at that puffed up neck. We can hear calling. It's not that one calling, but it's the same type. It's called a red crested Koran. Come on, give us a call. Now the reason they sit up on top of termite mines like that or out in the open is that so they can look for friends or lady friends in particular so they're quite visible. Well he's being a little bit boring today, he's not calling or giving us a show. So we're going to keep looking for another one of our big cats, the leopard. So we've already been through all the cats that Derek asked about and uh, we're going to keep looking for one of them now. Hopefully we'll have some leopard luck, you never know. And one of the best ways to find leopards is to look in the sand. You think I'm joking? I'm not. So they obviously leave footprints and so whenever I see a nice little bit of soft sand, I have a quick look, make sure there's no leopard footprints there so I know where they're going. Now, another person who likes looking in the sand, and it's a bit easier for him because he's marching around on foot, is James. Let's go see what he's up to. I'm not looking in the sand now, everybody. I'm standing on a tree looking for Herbert. I don't know where he's gone. I think he's gone off down there somewhere, hopefully finding something special. But this is a very special kind of tree that we have out here, and it's called a marula tree. And the marula tree produces the most delicious fruit that you, ever, you could ever imagine. And that happens around about January time. In fact, some of them have already started to produce small fruits already, but they won't be ripe to around sort of December, January time and then they are very delicious indeed. Lots of vitamin C, lots of sugar, so they're sweet and lovely. 
This one has been pushed over by an elephant. Now, if you look around here on the ground, you can see that there are no fruits, no pips, no nuts on the ground, which means that this was a male tree. Only the female trees produce the fruit, and the elephants seem to not push those trees over. And I suspect they pushed this one over because they were trying to get at these leaves over here that Brian's going to show you, nice and fresh, and the elephants do like to eat the leaves of the marula tree, and sometimes also the bark, especially when it is very dry. And we've just had a very nasty drought, and I think that the elephants probably pushed this tree over then. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> Kemaya, you say, if we're out here on foot, would we eat the animals? Kemaya, well, we don't have to really, because we're allowed to go back to camp at the night time, and then we have a meal cooked very similar to the one probably that you're going to have when you get home this evening. Um, but if we had to live out here, could we survive? Yes, we could, but then we would have to hunt one or two animals. But remember, if we hunted a small impala, which weighs, say, I don't know, 120 pounds or so, that would last a family at least a week if you managed to dry the meat properly and didn't let it rot. So yes, we would have to hunt, but we wouldn't have to hunt too many animals. There would never be an effect where we would kill all the animals and be we you know, live in an area where there weren't any animals anymore. There are roots and berries and fruits and things out here to survive unless you can hunt. And that's the way it's been in this area for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But the best fruit to eat, of course, is the Christmas and January marula fruit. That's the nicest thing. Now I'm going to try and climb out of this tree without falling over. And if I do fall over, everybody, I hope that you will come and help me. Brian, will you help me? I'll film it. Brian says he won't help me, everybody. He's just going to film me. Now, while I'm doing this, I must just tell you that Taylor has very cleverly managed to find herself an animal. It is a small animal, and its name is Matsigito in Shitsonga. So let's go and have a look at that. We've got the smallest little carnivore in the Sabi sand, and this is called, well, the English name, is a dwarf mongoose. So probably a distant relative of a weasel, something along those lines. But they are tiny little critters, so if you had to pick up your ruler, they're probably just a little bit longer than that, really, really small. And as David zooms out, can you see all their little heads popping out of the termite mound? Isn't that just adorable? Now, as cute and as cuddly as they look, they are fierce creatures. They take down scorpions, they'll even go after snakes and beetles and grubs and all sorts of amazing things. But at the moment, they're being quite cautious and just keeping an eye out on us. Now, Miss Daniels, you're wondering what time of the day is the best to go out and look for animals, any time of the day, really. I enjoy morning safaris. Just hearing the dawn chorus as the birds wake up in the morning and catching that sunrise. But you can really go out at any day. Middle of the day, I've seen all sorts of different creatures. But ideally, it depends on the weather conditions. So it's nice, actually, to have a hot day to go on a safari. Because then you're most likely to get the animals coming down to drink water. On these cooler, windier days, things tend to hide away. But it seems as though we're having some luck this afternoon, which is wonderful. Now these little dwarf mongoose, they live in families, like I said, I counted five of them so far. One, two, three, four, five, yes, I can only see five. You can see the three heads there. And then you can see the two down on the left. And they usually use these termite mounds that have got natural tunnel systems. They obviously widen them though, so they can fit inside. And they'll probably sleep here, or maybe this is just a hiding spot, a temporary spot in case an eagle or something flies over that could potentially try and eat them, then they need to race away and hide. And this is, makes for a fantastic little spot. But they can live in big families. Oh, I just heard some thunder. Now, Aurora, you've asked a fantastic question this afternoon. You want to know, can these dwarf mongoose see in the dark? And you can see they've got beautiful red eyes or reddish brown eyes with the biggest pupils you've ever seen. And they're very inquisitive and staring at us at the moment. 
Now, I don't think their eyesight is particularly good at night because they actually go to bed as soon as the sun sets. So they are diurnal animals, which means that they are active during the day. But I reckon their eyesight will probably be better than what yours and my eyesight is at night. And that's the thing out here is that these animals are incredible and have adapted to being able to survive in both the daytime and the nighttime. But luckily for these little, <laughs> these little ones, they don't have to worry about too much at night. They all cuddle up in a termite mound with each other and will try and keep nice and warm. And that's another thing about going on the early morning safaris is that you will normally see a scene quite similar to this, but it's of them waking up, poking their heads out and trying to get the warm rays of the sun to warm their bellies up. I was hoping they were going to come out, but we're quite close to them. We're only a couple of feet away. Now, Raina, we were mentioning earlier about how fierce these creatures are, and you wanted to know what do these mongoose eat. They feed on scorpions, they feed on snakes, they will even eat beetles and the grubs, and anything that really moves. I suppose if they can get hold of a little lizard, they'll probably eat that too. But they eat a variety of different things. But like I said, these are the smallest predators that we have in this particular area. Now, speaking of, of predators and what the dwarf mongoose eat, Daphne, you were wondering what is the predator of this dwarf mongoose? Eagles, snakes, or even some of the things that they're going after as food, they will actually turn the tables and try and go for them. But really anything, even a young lion cub, if it were to catch a little mongoose like this, would be very good and valuable sort of learning behavior on how to hunt. Even a leopard, a hyena, you name it. But I think the biggest threat to the dwarf mongoose has to be the different birds of prey. So the martial eagles, the dark chanting goshawks, lizard buzzards, you name it, all these wonderful little birds will swoop down and try and catch these little critters. But they are quick. And because they live in a family group, there's lots of eyes always watching around, making sure that nobody's trying to eat them. So if somebody does come around, one will give an alarm call, and it's a high-pitched squeaking noise, and they will all race for co cover. So either in the termite mound or in a fallen log. Now, Mia, you've stumped me here. You want to know how much does a dwarf mongoose weigh? I don't think it weighs more than about 500 grams. Oh my goodness, it's, it's really, really light. It's uh, probably only about, how much is that? David? I have no idea. Louise, can you please help me with my conversion because I've gone completely blank for some <laughs> reason. Probably, we're going to have a look and just convert it. I must apologize. My brain is not working very well this afternoon, but very, very, very light. They're not heavy at all. Like I said, we, we use kilograms and grams, but I wouldn't say more than about Ah, there we go. Thank you, Louise. So Louise says it's about 17 ounces or so. So quite, quite small. Remember, if you take your ruler that you'll use at school and you look at the length of it, it's probably just a little bit longer than that. So not, not big at all. Like I said, they're like ferrets, but mini ferrets. We get different types of mongoose species though in South Africa. In this area though, this is the most common. And then we also get the banded mongoose, which lives in family groups, but they've got stripes on their body as their name suggests and probably about double the size and then another one called the slender mongoose which is a little bit more elusive and quite shy and they live on their own so we call that solitary so we don't usually see them very often but thankfully that these little critters are so curious and one of my favorite things to do when I was guiding at a lodge was to get my guests out of the vehicle and actually sit on the ground close to a termite mound that I knew that I'd seen a mongoose run into and we'd sit and sit and sit maybe for 20 or 30 minutes and eventually the mongoose would relax and poke their heads out like they're doing now. Some of them would even creep out of the termite mound and move around and sort of carry on foraging which was quite incredible but you had to sit very very still because even if you moved your toes they would race back into their mound. 
but that was definitely one of the highlights. And I wonder if they can understand me. Now, Asegaile, you're wondering if the mom mongoose will go out and hunt. They will all go out and forage together. So they, they, they work in, in groups and they'll sort of move around in an area and they will dig for termites or beetles that are maybe moving under the ground or a scorpion, they'll dig out of their burrows. And if it is a young little mongoose, then mom or, mom or dad, they both of them will look for, for food. Remember, these little critters are, are able to move around quite quickly, only a couple of weeks that they won't be able to move around too much and fully depend on suckling from their mothers. But after that, they will come out and sort of move around with the family groups looking for food and learning. But of course, if mom finds something nice to eat or dad finds something nice to eat, we'll then call the little one over in the mongoose language and then obviously help feed it. But I just love it that they just haven't even moved. <laughs> just they're bobbing their heads in and out. As we speak about the little mongoose, who Daphne was wondering if there are any babies here. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look like it. I can't see any particular small ones. Maybe there's some inside, but they wouldn't come out if they still had no hair. So these ones look relatively old. David, you see that one that's just poking its head out on the bottom right? Or that's just popped its head back in it. I think he saw it, or it saw me pointing at it. I think that one that one looks like a little one. We can't see it now, but you'll see David's going towards the hole that it had, was poking its head out of. But it seems to be quite shy. That one looked a little bit small, so possibly that was still a youngster. But the other ones, just by the size of their heads and their bodies, from what I can see, they look very much like adults. But can you see those claws? Look how sharp they are. Very good for digging. Oh wow, look how cool that is. Very, very long claws. Now Mia, you're wondering if these mongoose are cold-blooded animals. They're not. These are warm-blooded, so they are mammals. So they don't lay eggs, they give birth to live babies. And this is one of the characteristics of mammals, of warm-blooded animals, is the fact that they have got hair covering their body and also that they have mammary glands so that they are able to produce milk. We've obviously seen it with the reptiles and the birds. They don't have any mammary glands. Hello everyone. Look how sweet they are. I'm hoping though that they get a couple of the rays of the sun just before the sun sets so because I think they're going to be in for a chilly evening. Like I said, I heard some thunder rumbling in the distance. And in the far, far, far distance, there's some dark skies coming. So perhaps we're going to be lucky and get some rain this evening. But I think we're going to say goodbye to these little mongoose now. We're going to carry on. And I'd actually like to try and find some elephants, as well as look, of course, we'll continue looking for Mr. Tangana, who hopefully is going to pop around a bit later. But as we continue the search for either elephants or Tangana, let's go across to Mr. Henry. Just listening here, everybody, um, I just want to show you some... Ah, Herbert's found something. This is a piece of plant called Zizifus mucronata. Try and say that a few times. Zizifus mucronata. Mm. You must all eat your greens. Don't forget, you must eat your greens. And all of the animals like to eat these, even though they've got such vicious thorns. And one of the reasons, of course, that it has vicious thorns is that there is such a lot of nutrition in the leaves. All the animals like to eat them. Now come over here. Herbert's found something else special for us. Mm -hmm. I didn't give any to Brian, which wasn't very nice of me. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Brian says it's okay, everybody. Now, Herbert has gone and found something that I don't know the origin of, but it's quite pretty. It's gone. Oh, there it is. Here. Look at this fruit. Oh, I do know exactly what this is. This is a beautiful plant called a num-num. 
Isn't that lovely? Now, it's already made its flowers. Now, that's quite unusual. Remember, we've only just started the summer in this part of the world, and these flowers, or these plants, um, make very beautiful white flowers called, uh, well, they're called num-nums, really, and they smell like jasmine. Now, what happens when you make a flower, or when a plant makes a flower, is that the flower eventually gets fertilized, and then it makes a fruit like that. So every time you eat a peach, or let's say an apricot, or a berry, or something like that, remember that it was once a flower, and it was fertilized, it was pollinated, and it became a fruit like this. Isn't that lovely? Mason, you all seem to be rather fascinated by the death and danger that is capable out here. Well, you want to know, Mason, what is the most dangerous plant out here? Um, there are a few poisonous plants. I'll tell you one of the most dangerous ones. In fact, I can probably find one for you. Come over here, Mason. Come with me. We'll just go down into this little thicket here. In fact, I can see one of these trees immediately. It's a special tree, Mason, called the Tamburti tree, and I would call this a particularly dangerous plant simply because it has a sap, which I'm going to show you now, that is white. And that white sap is very poisonous to human beings. This tree here. If you ever come to Africa, Mason, remember, if you see a tree like this, you must not try and cook on it, and you must not eat the leaves. And I'll show you what I mean. See there, on the end of the leaf, there's some white sap. Now that sap we call a milky latex, and it's very, very toxic and poisonous to human beings. So if you eat that, what happens is you can actually die if you eat enough of it. Uh, initially what it does is it gives you a very runny tummy. And if you try and cook on the wood from this tamburti tree, it will make the meat that you've cooked very bad indeed, and that can actually kill you. So that's the, probably the most dangerous plant in Africa that I know, and it's called tamburti, or Spirostachys africana. Spirostachys africanus. Okay. Nice question, mate. Stumped when you first asked. I didn't quite know what you meant, but there we figured it out now. Alrighty, let's head back across to Brent. He's got a couple of antelope to show you. I'm not sure what kind of antelope. We have nine species here. Let's go and find out which one it is. We've got a nice mixed group of antelope here. We've got some Inyala. Those are the chocolatey brown ones. And Impala. Those are the slightly light colored ones. Slightly smaller as well. Now, it's not uncommon to find different antelope species hanging around together. And the theory behind that is that more eyes you've got, the better the chance to spot the lions and the leopards is. And we can have a look. Some of those female impala are extremely pregnant. Clayton would like to know if we've got any wildebeest or gnus. Uh, maybe he's been doing a research project on the great migration in Kenya. So uh, we do have wildebeest. We don't have a big migration like that. Our wildebeest generally are in groups of 15 to, to at the big side, 30. And the males stay in one place and the females move between the different groups of male or different male wildebeest. Now, oh, what have they all spotted all of a sudden? A lot of heads went up at the same time. Now it pays to be cautious, Archer, of course. I'm really hoping we're going to see the first baby of the season. So impalas give birth at this time of the year. Pinalas can give birth any time. Except those ones, because those are boys. Okay, well, we're going to keep moving. You can see, actually see how pregnant they are there now. Well, Kira's wondering, what do the antelope eat? Well, you can see those impala are eating grass. Now, impala eat grass and leaves, whereas inyala only eat leaves and bushes. So it all depends. Different animals eat different things. And a wildebeest only eats grass. Very windy. They've got to be extra careful when it's very windy in case something sneaks up on them because they can't hear too well or smell too well. There's that beautiful young male in Nyala.
Well, hello, Zoe. Nice to have you with us, Zoe. Uh, Zoe's wondering why do antelope have antlers? They don't, Zoe. Now let's go have a look um, at the far right, the biggest male. There's also a female in Yala there. Under the tree. You got them there. Uh, there's a tree in the way. Um, there you go. There we go. You can see there. So those are horns, Zoe. Those are not antlers. So they never fall off. So they're bone on the inside, covered by a layer of dense hair called or hair, which is keratin. And whereas antlers are only keratin, and they grow seasonally and fall off. Whereas horns are with that animal for the rest of its life, unless it breaks them. And when it breaks them, they don't grow back. And that's the major difference between antelope and deer. We don't have any deer in South Africa, well, not indigenous deer. So all the animals, all the antelope we have, uh, all of them have horns sometimes males and females have horns but most of the time only the boys have horns and the girls don't well let's keep on searching we're all right down in the south of Juma have another look now quickly for Haven who would like to know why are there stripes on the impala's tail Whoop, there we go. Now, you guys get ticks in the USA. We also get ticks here. And those black, dark areas are to, ooh, to try draw the ticks away from its uh, softer areas. So it, that black helps to draw the ticks away from its nether areas. There we go, that's why there's stripes there. Um, I just gotta be on the game drive radio quickly. Rex, um, where are those in Konzo? We would, um, on Gary Main heading west at the moment. Where would you like me to check? So, Rexon's just found footprints of leopards with two babies. So, I'm going to go see if we can help him find those leopards. Copy, thanks, Rex. Um, I'm about to cross Moati. Okay, so it's a very, very exciting. This, we're going to go look for a female leopard whose name is Karula. And uh, she is our dominant female, so she holds territory and she's got two cubs that are, oh, what are they now, nine months, nearly 10 months old. So it'd be very exciting if we can find them. I love spending time with that leopard family. Well, it's been great to have not one, not two, but three schools with us today. I hope you guys have enjoyed, and we hope to have you back on uh, live safari soon. But I hope the rest of your school day has been as fun as it this has been for us, and a toodaloo for now. So welcome everyone, and isn't it great to be able to educate uh, people from all over the world in schools. Uh, it is a very special thing and a, a great responsibility for us, one that we accept with relish. Now, of course, and there's lots of you going to be wondering about uh, what's happening with the lions. I'm going to give you a quick brief update. And remember, we can't speculate. We're just going to have to wait to find out what happens. So as you saw, there were only four Inkahuma cubs. And two have died. And uh, their, their carcasses have been collected and have been sent away for testing. So as soon as we know, we will let you know immediately. Now, it is very sad, but so far, everything is pointing towards a natural disease, not one that has been brought in by human beings or whatnot. But as I said, we can't be 100% sure. That's just what it looks like so far. And uh, hopefully, those other four cups that we've seen there, they look relatively healthy, they look good. Hopefully, they're, they're not gonna be affected by that disease.
excitement. Karula's tracks have come back from the south. Rexon spotted them, so we're going to go give them a hand. Now we're heading east from the old roadworks quarry, which is probably about two kilometers up ahead. So I'm going to check to make sure she hasn't done a Queen Karula and snuck back to the south. And I'm keeping my eye out hopefully we're gonna have a little leopard luck it feels like I've spent so much time with lions over the last while I've forgotten what a leopard looks like I think while we look for Queen Karula, oh, Rexon's getting hold of me. Copy Rex, I'll check from Weaver's Nest to Treehouse. Okay, so Rex has given me a job where to check, but while we go checking, but while we go checking, I think it's time for a nearly impossible tree quiz. Ha ha. Now let's see our, our Oh, hang on, before we nearly impossible tree quiz, let's just binocular. Oh dear, my binoculars have caught on the, the radio. Let's give me a split second here. There we go, that one, not that radio, the other one. So many radios here. Ha, voila. I a bush. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I saw something lying under the bush up ahead. I thought, oh, could it be? Could we be so lucky that it is Queen Karula? Now, a nearly impossible tree quest. Doom, 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 doom. Let's see what tree we can find for you. It can't be too easy, because otherwise in a split second you guys have got it right. <whistles> Come on, where's a tree that's got leaves? I think... I think it's a bit unfair to ask you one without leaves. Or is it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I think maybe we should start with a slightly easier one. Aha, there we go. Let's start with this one. And then we can always work our way to a more difficult one. There we go. It's one of the elephant's favorite foods. It's got a bipinnate compound leaf and big thorns. If you know what tree this is, uh, let me know by using the hashtag Safari Live or pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Here we go. Look at the young branches. Oh, we can hear lightning in the distance. I mean, not lightning, can't hear lightning. We can see lightning, we can hear thunder in the distance. And there we go. Let's see how quick you guys are today. And while we continue to look for the Queen of Juma, Karula. I think James has found something smelly. Well, we have found something smelly, everybody, and I do warn you that this is not particularly delightful to look at. But I'm going to ask you to suspend your disgust and enjoy the sighting with me because it is very interesting from a biological point of view. I do warn you, it's pretty disgusting. Now, many of you would have been following the fate of this buffalo. This buffalo, of course, is in fact dead. It is not alive, is it, Brian? No. Why? How do we know that? Uh, because it's not breathing. It is not breathing, that is correct. Also, it is not chasing us, which indicates that it is not, in fact, alive. Now, everyone, what is interesting here, yesterday, many of you would have seen it. Steph came here, and there were maggots all over the place, and there was still quite a lot of moisture. Now, it looks like that moisture is all finished, and we're just left with a hard sort of leather of the skin that has been partly eaten away, and there is none of that really sort of, I don't know, what would we say, tar-like black gunk coming out of this buffalo anymore. The flies have gone, and so have all of the maggots. 
well just about there one or two left and there are a few beetles around the place now what's interesting is this thing i think we've about two weeks ago, it had died in the water down at Bifosuk Dam. It was then dragged here by a tractor and left. And what's fascinating is that until last night, no predators had come here at all, other than the avian scavengers, so the vultures had been to have a go, and obviously the flies, you can describe them as predators as well. Then, last night, a hyena came here. I'm assuming it was a hyena. It opened up the ribcage, and it's bitten off the ribs. It's had some very nice buffalo rib there. It's cleaned off the sort of sinew, although I doubt there was much left. I'm sure most of it would have disappeared. And then it came around this side to the nose. And as Brian showed you earlier on, the nose has now been kind of chewed off. And what we're left with is a whole lot of teeth on the ground. These are the incisors from the bottom jaw. They used to go in this hole over here. Can you see this hole, Brian? One, there are the teeth and there's the hole. You'll notice I'm not touching this with my hands. Herbert said to me, as if I needed any warning, he said, do not touch this with your hands. And I quite agreed with him. I thought that was a very good idea. And of course, the buffalo only has incisors on the bottom part. Teeth could be very good and when I look at the horns of this buffalo, that this buffalo was not particularly old when he died. He wasn't necessarily sort of on his last legs, but I think the drought and disease that came with the drought probably knocked him out. The reason I paused there is some quite interesting ticks still trying to eat off him. And I suspect they're going to struggle to find any form of nutrition. Look at these rather interestingly colored golden yellow ticks. Again, not something I'm going to pick up with my hands. Hmm. Paul, you say it looks like it's mummified. That's precisely what's happened. It's just kind of rotted on its own. And that's so unusual out here. And I think that there's a much wider story to tell about this buffalo and about the lions that have been eating the buffalo and the reason that this buffalo and many of the others that have been killed have not been eaten. And I think you, you'll find that that story has got quite a lot to do with the fact that there's a disease in these buffaloes. Well, there are probably many diseases in them. They've eaten very poorly over the last poor, almost six months. And that means diseases are starting to take hold. This carcass was rejected outright by lions came past here there must have been leopard coming past here hyenas well first time last night after 14 days one or two vultures had a go at it but that was all and I think the wider story is one that, of course, we've seen played out with the Inkahumas, a very sad story, of the cubs now falling prey to what we think is something called white muscle disease, which is precisely from eating a diseased and nutrient-deficient buffalo. The mothers are not producing the milk with the selenium and vitamin E that they should be, and the cubs are therefore struggling. And so it's quite a wide and interesting drought story that we've been telling. Right, that is the buffalo. Brian, would you like to spend any longer here at all, ever? No. No, because the smell is... It's horrendous. The smell is horrendous. Okay, good, let's carry on. Um, Herbie, should we head this way? Right, Herbert says we should go this way. So we'll pop off here and we'll go and have a quick look at the dam and see if there's anything drinking water. Well, because that's all there is to drink in the dam, really, isn't there, Brian? Yeah. Yes, it's not exactly a, a, a bush pub. All right, we're about 50 meters from the dam. Let's head across to Brent to get an update from him, and we'll see you there if there's anything there. Well, no sign of the Queen of Juma just yet, but there has been this wonderful burst of sunlight to warm us up. But there's a very big storm that was hiding amongst those clouds. And we're starting to see the top of it coming through now. I mean, look at that. It is always awesome to have light, nice bright sunlight with a dark sky coming in. Makes for some beautiful scenery. Now, the only thing that could make it better is if we put Karula, Hosanna, and Shongile with that backdrop behind them. There's a monkey track. That is not what we're looking for.
So it was not a weeping wattle. It was indeed an acacia, Patricia. Well, what's what Patricia said? Acacia. But I would like to know which acacia. Okay. Uh, so her last tracks were coming through this sort of way. So I'm going to head down towards Twin Dams or Elephant Carcass area and uh, their tracks of the cubs are with her as well. So fingers crossed she's made a kill and we're going to find her languishing in a nice large tree near the Mawati River. Okay. Always look carefully around these areas. You never know if she's stashed the cubs in one of the little river systems that are, are around here. This is the one that goes from treehouse waterhole down towards the Mawati. And a very firm favorite of Karula, gosh, Karula. What track is that? It is Howard the Hyena. It is not the Royal Lady. Okay. I've got a funny feeling that she might be close to the Mawati. I don't know. Uh, if I don't have any really good tracks to go on, quite often how I find animals is uh, I try to think like an animal and I go on my gut instinct and my gut instinct says we should check the Mawati. So everyone we're now thinking like Queen Karula. So we're thinking like Karula. I'm going to stop, pop my head up, see if there's any impala around. Nah, nothing. Carry on. Okay, uh, Karen would like to know, is it a white thorn acacia? It is not, Karen, but that is getting closer. So we're still being Karula, walking down here. What did I hear? Could it be? I thought I heard. Coming from somewhere around here. So, they have woodlands kingfishers have been seen close to us, just to the south of us on Chitwa Chitwa. Oh, and I've almost forgot wonderful news. I spoke to Yors on the radio and young Sindile has been seen just about a kilometer to the east of our boundary. What's that? Some uh, Inyala. Now they're looking quite alert. Now I don't know if they've spotted Rexon who's tracking in the block. Oh, I'm hoping they'd rather spotted Karula. Nothing yet Rex. I'm just following up on some squirrel and a go air bird alarm calls close to the Mawati elephant carcass. Okay well we're gonna keep searching for the Queen and uh, you guys are gonna have to keep thinking about what that tree is. And while we do that, let's go back to James, who's sitting next to a waterhole. I am sitting, everybody, on a peninsula overlooking the great Biffles Hook Lake. And here I am meditating at the magnificence of the western horizon, the sun now beginning to peep through the clouds there. You can see the horizon is something spectacular. There is an enormous storm blowing in from the south here. It is uh, bearing with it thunder. <laughs> Thankfully, no lightning yet, but of course, if there is lightning, I shall simply stand next to Brian, who is six feet four and with a big pole on the back, and so I should be safe standing next to him. 
There's nothing else going on here. A couple of birds. We've got the... I spotted it. The wood sandpiper was here somewhere. But now it seems to have absconded. Anyway, that's one of the first migrant birds to come along here. Then we also had a couple of blaps, blacksmith lapwings. They also seem to have gone off. And one lonely Egyptian goose from the pair of the most uh, incompetent parents, of course, that we've seen at Juma. They lost all seven of their little goslings last year. Hopefully they'll be a little more useful this year. Right, and that was Biffleshook Dam. Nothing else seems to have come down to drink. This is not very surprising, of course, because we are sitting in a pretty chilly day. It's been fairly windswept and wind blown. Now we'll go up through here, see if we can find something interesting. Sean, you're sitting in Secunda, where I guarantee you it's more dangerous than it is living here where we are. You say, what is the most dangerous animal to find on foot here? Um, Sean, it very much depends on what the animal's doing and in what state it is. So, for example, at the moment, the animal that I want to walk into the least would be a buffalo bull. Now, the buffalo, of course, are tremendously stressed at the moment, and that means they're on edge, they're nervous, they've been eaten by lions, well, you know, sort of 40 or so of them in the last 50 days have been devoured by the Inkahuma pride. And so I think what I don't want to walk into the most right now is a buffalo bull. That's not always the case. I have walked sort of from me to you away from a buffalo bull before. He's just kind of looked up chewing and not worried about me. Um, in normal circumstances, I suppose, depending on where you are, <laughs> Brian was just attacked by an obthorn tree. Um, in normal cir circumstances, I guess an elephant herd is something you want to be very careful of walking into because, of course, an elephant herd, um, they can be very protective of their calves. It can be quite difficult for them, and so they can be quite stressed out. So I guess elephant herd and buffalo bull would be the two things that I'd want to avoid the most. Good. All right, well, we're going to carry on looking for small things out here. There's some flowers, but let's head across to Taylor and get an update from her, and we'll join you shortly with something else. Now, sadly, we're not having much luck with the elephants and the leopards just yet. I believe Brent is on it, and he's managed to pick up some tracks of a leopard. We're not sure who just yet, but hopefully something develops. From that, it seems as though Brent is on a roll this afternoon. Now, David, where are we going to look for elephants? Because I'm really, look I want to see them this afternoon. We, that's very specific, right? David says that there's elephants on Weaver's Nest, so we're going to take his word from it. Yeah. And if we don't find elephants on Weaver's Nest, we know who to blame. <laughs> we'll go down that way, though. We're a little bit wee way away from that. But we shall continue and have a look so far. Let's see what's happening around here. But there's thunder coming in, so I wonder if we're going to perhaps get a bit of rain a little bit later. Hey, look at the sky. Oh, I don't know if we're really going to get... Hang on, David. Let me go forward again. I'm going to show you because there was some nice crepuscular rays shining through the clouds. Where are you? There's the gap. Isn't that lovely? And I think that this is as much of a sunset as that we're probably going to get this evening. Unfortunately, the clouds are coming in thick, and it seems like there's a bit of weather that's coming from the east. So I wonder what's going to happen there, but we'll have to wait until a bit later, I suppose. Right. Hmm. And I believe that Prince said he thought he may have heard the first Woodlands Kingfisher. That's quite exciting. Now, we, oh, sorry, let me just hold on. David, you're holding on? Bit of a big dip over there. Now, James, you were saying that you also hoped that we would see some elephants and a leopard this afternoon. Wouldn't that be quite lovely? Now, I'm not sure where Tangana disappeared to, though. I'm actually wondering if I shouldn't perhaps head a bit further west and maybe go check that western sector, seeing as though Brent is now uh, down here on the south, sort of eastern corner. I think that makes more sense. He's on the tracks this side, and I think Rexon is helping him search. So I think we're going to head probably down towards Mvubu Road. We'll have a check around there and just see if we can pick up on any footprints, because... 
the odd occasion I have seen Tangana, what he what I have seen, I think three or four times in a row, often late at night when we're on our way back after the show is finished. We, I always see him coming down past and going over the cross of the dam wall and then going straight towards Mvubu Road. So maybe we'll go and have a look around there and, and, and have a look. Because there was definitely nothing at Bavulzok Dam. And I know James is also there now and he's been on foot, so he would have easily spotted uh, some footprints, actually much better than what I, myself or David, would have had. Now, I can't believe how quiet it's been. David, you know that we haven't seen one impala yet today? Not one impala, can you believe it? The most common antelope in Africa is evading us today. So we may have to swing past quarantine as well because we know that every time we go there, that's where they probably will be. Right. Come on, animals, where are you? Not even an insect, not even a... <laughs> Not even, I wanted to say millipede and then I wanted to say shongololo at the same time, so you got a m -m Apologies for that, my stuttering this afternoon. So terrible. James probably would have had a good laugh at that. Yes, at least Kirsty and Louise found it very funny. That's fine. I don't mind. As long as I'm keeping you entertained and making you laugh every now and then, that, that's fine with me. Now, who have we got sitting on the street, David? We've got life. We do. We have life. We've got two lives. It looks as though... Oh, look how cool that is. We have a battalier. Hello, Batelier. Very easy to identify with the red beak. And it looks as though it's still a juvenile. Did you see that? How it wasn't completely black. And there's somebody else. Now, David, who's that? We're going to have to have a closer look. That looks like a Wahlberg's eagle. Is it? No, it looks a little bit too big. Maybe that's another juvenile. That's a difficult one. It's quite difficult to see because if you look at its facial skin, it looks a bit grey, but then it looks a bit yellow too. Hmm, I'm going to have to change my mind there. And I'm going to say Tawny Eagle. We'll go with Tawny Eagle. You know, you can see, oh, there you go. I can actually see the tail now that I look carefully. But for a moment, when I first looked at its face, because that's often where I'm, I'm drawn to looking, is checking the eye colour and, of course, the beak. And initially, it actually looked completely grey, which is typical of a of a juvenile battalier. But it's not. It's a tawny eagle. It's it's quite interesting to see the two of them, sort of in such close proximity. And normally, these two species of birds, the battalier and the tawny eagle, are often the first ones to spot carcasses on the ground because they fly at such a a lower level compared to the vultures. So I wonder if they've found something, or perhaps they're just taking a rest, trying to keep out of the wind. You can see it's very windy out here today, as the branches blow around in the, in the background. But I think it's actually quite lovely to see this juvenile battalier. Like I said, even though it's got this, the red legs and the red facial colouring now, its feathers are still chocolate brown. So it's probably in its last year before it reaches adulthood. It would be nice if we could actually see it take off and open its wings and see how far along that white wing panelling is coming along. But for now, there we go, actually opening its feathers. Can you see the white on the inside underneath its wing? So I think it's definitely in its final stages and almost about to become an adult. So it must be around five or six years old, somewhere around there. What a lovely bird. Giving itself a good preen. Perhaps they've already feasted on something during the day. There's definitely no shortage around at the moment of food for the various carnivorous species from the, well, the mammals and of course right through to the predatory birds. Look at that drongo though, that drongo is definitely not happy. With the battalier and the tawny eagle you can see that, that there the, there's the drongo right in the top of the middle of your screen. You can see that that battalier was also looking up, just keeping a cautious eye on it. 
But wasn't that lovely? Thank goodness, this the saving of the day of the Battelier and the Tawny Eagle. And, of course, the Drongo, who we can't forget. That was lovely. It's always nice to see a couple of birds. Now, we're going to carry, long, carry on along towards the western sector to see if we can find Tangana, maybe some elephants. And, uh, well, I'm going to have to say goodbye to you for a little bit, but let's go back across to James and see how he's doing with that buffalo carcass that he had earlier. I wonder if he's not sick. This is Nongonoko, everybody. It's a special kind of a tree, and it's called Nongonoko, which means single file. Now, single file, you can see why it would be called that, because of the leaf arrangement here. And Herbert has just to told me, I didn't know that this thing had anything interesting about it, but there's a belief around here that if you go fishing, for example, you take a root of this tree with you and you put it on your belt or somewhere like that, and if you catch one fish, then all of the fish will come in single file to the same place that the first fish was. Same thing if you're trying to trap an animal, you'll tie this next to the trap, and if one animal comes along there, this will inspire them through the medium of uh, probably quantum physics, uh, to, <laughs> Brian is nodding, to come in single file towards the trap, and you will have a lot to eat forever and ever. It is otherwise known as the bush dwarf bush cherry, or Meirua parvifo. Very nice. Now we're just heading through here. We've left Beefle's Hook Dam area and we're wandering through some relatively thick bush. Herbie's just gone up in front. And now, of course, one of the most terrifying plants that you find in America is something called poison ivy. And it, I think it leaves you with great big horrible welts all over your skin. And Diane in Texas, you want to know if we get these here, if we get poison ivy here, and the answer is no, we don't. There's nothing nasty like poison ivy here, but we do get nettles sometimes, which can give you a little bit of an itch and a scratch, but nothing too bad. Then, look at this flower, this gorgeous flower, called the String of Stars, Heliotropum species. And it's one of my favorites because it's one of the first to come out. It's also one of the first that I ever learned to identify. And it's also very easy to identify because it looks like a string of stars. String of stars. Well done, Brian. Excellent job. And there were also some ants living on it. And I suspect that it's probably pollinated by ants. I'm just going to smell it. And it does actually have a smell. Wow. That is actually spectacular. I'm going to put it under Brian's nostril. What does it smell like, Brian? I don't even know. It's like honey. Mm, yeah. It smells like honey, fresh, mm. delicious honey. And I'm sure that's what attracts, it's probably the nectar inside it that smells like that, and I'm sure that's what's attracting the ants as they pollinate them. That really is absolutely delicious. It's very subtle. You only get it if you stick it right under your nose. So everybody, take a very deep breath in. Fresh honey. And imagine fresh honey. That is gorgeous. Right, that is a string of stars. Very nice, Brian. Wonderful. On we go. Right, we're going to walk along this game path here and see what we can see. We haven't seen anything in the way of mammals yet. We saw a couple of nyala when we started off. Bad luck, Brian. Careful. <laughs> Brian, of course, is kind of hindered by a fairly substantial pole sticking out of his back. And this is made worse by the fact that he is so enormous himself. Now, one of the other things... Oh, the light is just now spectacular. Brian, how do I look in the light? Oh, you look fantastic. Do I look heavenly? Amazingly Good. heavenly. Thank you. Now, what else we have here is, of course, the baboon's tail, which many of you have seen many times before. But what I think is so interesting is that this will go dormant almost as soon as the soil goes dry. And it's a brilliant plant. It goes flushes green every time there's any moisture, doesn't matter if it's in the middle of winter or the middle of summer, and then as soon as it's dry, as soon as conditions are not good, it goes completely dormant. And little lion cubs love to play with this thing. It's the most wonderful thing to watch. Then there's another lovely flower over here while we're on the theme of flower. And this one here, if I'm not mistaken, is a kind of devil's thorn. No, it's not. In fact, it's something completely different. I don't know what that is. Brian, what do you think? Any idea? Gushe. Gushe. <laughs> it says it's something called Gushe. 
Do you want? Switch. Ah, okay. So it's a kind of um, it's a kind of a spinach that you can eat, and it's a little bit slimy. I'm just going to taste it. I suspect you're supposed to cook it, are you? Hmm. I think cooked it might be a little bit better. Uh, it's got the texture of a fairly se severe sandpaper. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's disgusting. Anyway, we'll remember gushe, but we'll also remember next time to cook it. I don't know what it is in English, but it's a beautiful flower. And unsurprisingly, it doesn't smell. Normally, only the white flowers out here smell. Very few other flowers smell at all. And that's because the white flowers tend to be pollinated by well, things like bees or ants that are after nectar. Right, on we go. Gushe. Say it three times, Brian. It will help you to remember. Gushe. 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 Good. <laughs> We'll just carefully make our way through here. Now, if you are on foot in the bush, of course, what you must do is make sure that you know where the wind is blowing. And I haven't been on foot for a while, so I'm just going to test the wind with my ash bag. This was a sock given to me when I was the master of ceremonies at a wedding, Brian, but I lost the other one, so well, I thought it would make quite a good um, quite a good ash bag. It was a personal story. Did you like it? Yeah, yes, very good. Okay, and... <laughs> What you need to do, so the wind's blowing that way, and the bush is getting quite thick. And so what we need to do is just be a little bit careful as the summer starts to progress, so the leaves get thicker, the bushes get thicker, we walk a bit slower, and we just check what's behind every bush, on top of every termite mound, especially as we were discussing with Sean in Secunda, I nearly said Sienical, Secunda, about the fact that it is a little bit dangerous. Right, now this is very exciting indeed. What have we got there? Okay, right, we're going to carry on going this way, everybody. Uh, Brent has got fresh leopard tracks and a drag mark. That's very exciting. Well, we found the drag marks. I've walked into the drainage. We found Cruel on a kill. I can't see whether the cubs are there, but very, very exciting. Rex has done all the hard work and got us looking in the right area. Uh, hey, and James, but I don't know, James, does James do any work? <laughs> so James, who's Rexon's tracker, and I used to work together at Londolozzi many years ago. Now, we're gonna try find a way in here. It is a little bit of a difficult spot. Okay, so she was just in here. So what I did, I, was, I wasn't feeling particularly brave, so I didn't walk straight into the thicket. I walked up onto the other bank to where I thought the tracks were going, looked down, and there she was, looking up at me like this. Like, what are you doing here? Right about halfway between Weaver's Nest and Twin Dams. see if we can get in here. So I spotted her from that tree and she was looking right at me. I mean, there's a cub. I can see one of the cubs. I think we might have to go to the other side up on top of the bank. And it looks like Shongile. Can you see her there, Jandre? And there's Hosanna as well. Okay, come out and down. Uh, that's that's Hosanna if you come closer to us. Yeah. On the ground. Oh there, yes, there she is. Um, I'm just gonna make some space now. Now Karula is oh, she's the just to the left. Um I don't know, we might be able to get a spot just to see her spots. Um, where are we now? There. There, you can just make out her spots. Oh, barely. Um, I'm just trying to see now. She's feeding at the moment. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna try find a spot where we can see a bit better and also make some space for Rex in here. I think we might have to try find a way to get on top of this, this on top of this bank in front of us. So I'm gonna have to drive out of here for now. It's not a very good spot. 
Okay, let's try to find another way. Rexy, you can come here and fall. I'm gonna try to get on top of the, 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 the drainage there. Okay, time for some tactical driving. I think there's a way to get up here. Oh, there he goes. I nearly fell out. My door opens. It, it happens quite often. We don't want to get stuck, which I think we are. <laughs> no. We just got into a weird spot here. That should be the worst of it. Now, the funniest thing is a lot of people pay a lot of money for tactical driving courses and things like that. And fortunately, none of them really train you for the, the rigors of getting into leopard and getting into leopard and lion sightings. Okay, watch your head, Jean Dre. And it is amazing where we are able to take these vehicles. Okay, here we go. We've got to the top. And I'm hoping we're gonna have a bit of a better view from up here. This is where I spotted, I saw Kruda from very close. Um, I was where this tree is here. No, I was a little bit further away. Okay, let me show you now. <laughs> Look, he's looking at us from at the bottom of the hill. There's little Shongile. A little bit forward. There she is. What is that madman Brent up to this time? And of course he's got genre, so it's definitely a very strange vehicle. Okay, let's try to get into spots now again. So there's the little Shongile. And I'm gonna just get you. So I was standing right here. You can even see my boot marks when I spotted Karula looking at me. How's that, Chandra? A little bit more. Only one, one branch. Right, hang on, hold on, Chandra. There's just one. There we go. Are we there? We're there. Okay. Okay. So I just need to chat to Aubrey on the radio quickly. Orbs, I don't know if you're going to get a visual from there. I think the best, is if, the best visual of all of them is to possibly see if you can come around and up onto this side. Okay, there we go. Success. I have I've, I haven't been seeing leopard in so long and I definitely haven't had the joy of coming on to Queen Karula on foot So very exciting. I'm so happy. Look at her. Isn't she a lovely lady? Didn't even snarl at me <laughs> And the cubs just looked and they, they, they've got so used to being tracked That. I can't see what the kill is. Well, Chai Connie says she appreci appreciates us trying to get the, the great view. Chai Connie, it is my absolute pleasure. I get as much enjoyment out of showing you the incredible animals we get as I do in seeing them myself. So uh, difficult to say what the kill is. <laughs> the moment it's just red meat, and there's that's Shongile Hosana. Unfortunately, from our current position, uh, we can't see. It doesn't look like a big kill. It looks like maybe a Daika or a Stenbok.
No. You can see why I didn't want to walk straight into those thickets. I would have nearly stood on her before I would have been able to see her. I think it's a diker. Just go down a little bit so you don't know where the fur is. And just zoom in, zoom in there. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's a diker. You can see the gray fur, a gray diker. Now, with the three of them, I'm pretty sure that's probably gonna be finished by tomorrow morning. And poor Karula's gonna have to hunt again. Chris says it's good to see mom getting a good meal instead of the cubs. I'm just trying to see, speaking of cubs, where Hosanna is. It is, and unfortunately, I'd love, I, we'd all love to spend all our time with Queen Krula, but she never really looks too hungry. She's such a proficient hunter that I think, and even with the hard job of feeding it to sort of bottomless pits, she, she keeps herself in good nick. Now, as I said, I don't think she's going to hoist this. I think it'll be gone before the opportunity to hoist comes upon her. And it looks like the cubs have had a good meal of it already. If we look at young Shongile down in the bottom of the riverbed, having a good little cat nap with a big belly. Now, the one thing you'll notice, and in all the time we've been spending with Karula, uh, you'll notice that leopards very seldom feed together. And they do that, because they are mostly solitary. So it's almost like timeshare at the carcass. When one's done, the other takes its place. And not to say they never feed together, but it is less common which is very different from lions, where they all get stuck in. Now, just to end off the nearly impossible tree quiz, I thought I had you all stumped. But, of course, Raisa, well done, Raisa's in Finland, and one of our, I would suppose we could call Raisa Fundi. Now, Fundi is Swahili for expert. She's very sharp on these things, and it indeed was Acacia Gerardi, the red thorn. Well done, Raisa. Should we move a little bit back, see if we can see Hosanna, see what he's up to? It looked like he might have moved up towards that little tree. Okay, so while we do that, and try to get you a view of the Prince of Juma, let's go see. Taylor and a feathered friend. I have a very grumpy feathered friend, as you can see. This lilac breasted roller does not seem to be impressed with the weather that is building up in the distance. It has fluffed itself all up as it's gotten quite cold, and I'm probably going to have to do a similar thing and add a jersey as it is. It's not nice anymore. David's like, he's got long pants on and a jacket on today. I've still got shorts. I should probably add a jacket so I don't get hypothermia. But isn't this little one lovely? Now I'm hoping that as we sit here, we're going to see it perhaps swoop down and catch an insect. There's been a lot of grasshoppers jumping about. It would be quite nice to actually see it do that. But I wonder if its priorities aren't set on just trying to keep warm this chilly afternoon but we seem to be having lots and lots of luck with the birds today and I'm it's actually quite funny because this afternoon just before we went out Brent and I were chatting as to what areas we were going to go and check and Brent said to me he goes I think I'm going to have a birding afternoon today and it seems as though the tables have turned completely and he's having all the luck with the leopards and I'm stuck with the birds not that it's a bad thing 
and the impala yes we finally found some impala and we're quite right so they, they seem to be heading straight over towards quarantine let's go have a better look what do you think david and maybe we'll see a bit of that sun i think maybe we'll get another glimpse of the sunset we'll we'll try it's always nice on a sunset safari to actually have a sunset but we'll see if the clouds play ball this afternoon All right and still no baby impala just yet but maybe we see some there seem to be quite a few impala around so we will check them all as we drive along let's check these ones oh no i don't know if these impala can have babies unfortunately because they're of course male impala and you can see what i mean as to how chilly it's got all of a sudden you see how they're starting to fluff themselves up they don't have their slick beautiful coats that they normally wear we're going to go forward now to go and have a look at the impala females oh here they all are I'm going to go up a little bit further forward because there's a couple of groups so we want to be able to check all the groups from one spot so we'll go up here to this little junction here we go now we can see them nicely you can see them all slowly making their way to the big open plains of quarantine where I'm sure that they will settle in unless we do get a big thunder shower then perhaps they will go and look for a bit of shelter but even the boys are looking good again at, at one point the impala males were looking a bit scruffy but it seems as though they've put on condition there's all the grass that's come through look how green quarantine is it's like a golf course at the moment which i'm sure that all the animals will be quite happy about and isn't that just a beautiful shot especially now that we can see the beautiful markings on the rump of that impala the three black stripes and those are of course very much like the round ring on a water buck's bum that is of course the impala's follow me sign but it doesn't look like we're going to have any little baby impala lambs around here but we'll keep on searching and let's go back across to james though who's found himself a caterpillar this everybody is a rather spectacular caterpillar now it's now become obviously as it's got onto television it's become highly mobile it's moving with a great speed but i don't know if you can see there brian did you manage to see there oh maybe i'll put it on my hand it's got sort of these sort of yellow fangs in the front of its head and i'm sure that's some way of making itself disguised to predators because those are they're, they're just decoration and if we look i'll try and sort of place it like this so we can look at it walking sorry brian but it's it's mouth parts are underneath that and so it's just purely decorative that sort of those two yellow horns and i'm sure their purpose is to con potential predators into thinking that perhaps it is a venomous animal of some sort don't you think brian mm, definitely but he's quite an impressive fellow now we found him on this staff which I had hoped to gather as my latest stick, but I see that it has been drilled into by wood borer beetles, and it is kind of giving me a couple of splinters, and you don't want that from a staff, do you, Brian? No. Gandalf staff never gave him splinters, I'm sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll just have to sand the thing. Now, what this is called, this is quite interesting. It's called negative geotropia. Yes, negative geotropia. We just can hear some ox peckers. Oxpeckers, of course, are a warning that there might be some other kind of a herbivore here. Could be a buffalo, could be an impala, could be a diker. Anyway, negative geotropia means hanging upside down. And so this chap is exhibiting negative geotropia. Now, there are some other small things I'd like Brian to show you. They are on 
two small things, that is my calves, and there are some flies there. Brian, would you be so kind as to demonstrate to everybody that I'm being devoured by a switch flies? You see that, Brian? I can. Now, quite quickly, it's, it's quite a pleasant, pleasant feeling, but for the one that is now trying to eat the scratch on my right hand foot. Can you see that, Brian? Mm -hmm. I'm now going to chase it away. Right, on we go. We're going to leave the staff and the caterpillar over here to uh, get on with life, as it were, and see what else we can see. We've started heading west now because, of course, we want to get to around quarantine, uh, pro probably around sunset time, just so that we have a bit of time left there in spare because we don't want to be out here in the dark. So were we to encounter something like a herd of elephants or perhaps a herd of buffalo, then we'd have to skirt them, and that might take a bit of time. So the idea is to be close to home by the time the sun sets. We've got about 25 minutes after sunset before it becomes unsafe to walk. Now, fantastic news that Brent found those leopards. Let's head straight across back to them and we'll head down into this rather ominous drainage line. We're still sitting with the queen as she devours uh, that little grey diker. We've definitely confirmed it's a grey diker. Only the hindquarters intact still. There's a chance they might be here still tomorrow morning, but it is it is quite slim. We can only hope that they are still here. Unfortunately, it's a difficult one for us to see all of the little ones. They are lying up against the bank, so... Look at that. And see her claws gripping the carcass in place. Okay, sorry, someone's calling me on the radio. If um, there's not much inyama yet left, I don't know, I think they're going to be here tomorrow. And Ephraim is just asking how much of the kill was left. Laura in New Mexico is wondering, do Karula and her, or do the cubs hunt while she's away hunting? And do they eat then? Uh, Laura, they do, but it's normally very small things like uh, maybe a dwarf mongoose or, or Franklin or even some grasshoppers and things. But they will eat a little bit, not much. They are still very heavily reliant on mom to provide sustenance at the moment. Now, it is not impossible uh, that at this age, about nine months, they can become independent. There is the record of a young male becoming independent because his mother was killed by lions at nine months old and he went on to survive as well. So incredible story there. But normally, as I said, with the females, year, year and a half, they will start looking to spend less and less time with their mother. Males, two, two to two and a half years, they spend a little bit longer with mom, find it a little bit harder to leave. See, I can hear the bone crunching from here, but I think with the wind it's going to be a bit difficult, Chandra. Yeah, so, so we can't put the ambient up, we'll just hear, which is possibly not very pleasant. <laughs> Zoe, you, you've probably put uh, or hit the nail on the head of something most trackers experience quite a lot. And uh, Zoe wants to know, I think I've... Oh, look, Orky's displaying. Oh, Zoe, I will answer your... Oh, no, don't go away. 
darn it. There was a southern boo-boo who was displaying, giving that wonderful call. I'll keep an eye out. He might pop up again. But, um, sorry, Zoe. Yes, Zoe. It says, do you think it's possible that I've been on foot with leopards many times and not known it? I would say probably more times than I've found them. They've seen me and, and I've walked right past them. They are incredibly good at camouflaging when they flatten themselves to the ground. Now, just so you know what's happening, I'm just checking both the cubs are still fast asleep in their same spots as they were. So we're going to stick with mum. And... Oof. No, it's gone again. Sorry, that Bobo is giving us a bit of a hard time flattering around us. Remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you've got any questions or if you'd prefer, pop us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. See, she's very alert. Even while she's feeding, she stops, listens every now and then. Making sure there's no potential threat I can hear something as well Karula it sounds like something walking Could be a buffalo, something big, uh, just off in the bushes, uh, probably about 200 meters from us. Oh, you can see she's stopped feeding. I wonder if one of the, no, she's back feeding now. And I wonder if one of the cubs is going to take her place. Oh, she's moving the carcass. That's a male diker, an adult male diker. There she is. I wonder if she's looking for a tree to hoist it in now that her and both the cubs are very, very full. Hassan has lifted his head, that's about it, but we can't really see him from, with a camera from where we are. I can just make him out under a porcupine bush. Now, the reason she's looking to possibly hoist it now is as we head into the crepuscular time of the day when the hyenas might start maneuvering, although I have forgotten what a hyena looks like. It's so long since I last saw one on Juma. There she goes. Let's see where she's taking it. Okay, let's keep following her. I'm gonna just reverse back. So Paul Jandre doesn't twist his spine. I wonder which tree she's gonna take it to. How am I behind me? Ah, oh, oh, look at that, she's gonna take it to that Tamburti. Let's, hold on, hold on, Jandre. I think she's gonna hoist it now. Ooh, let's get there quickly. There we go. Oh, we're in the perfect spot. She's going to hoist it up the Timburti tree. Oh, we got there just in the nick of time, Jandre. Although she's now waiting after our mad dash. <laughs> oh, 
Looks like she's almost an indecision. There we go. No, don't do it on the back side of the tree where we can't see. Taking a little break before lifting it, getting her strength up. There we go. There she goes. There she goes. She's looking back. One of the cubs is following her, but we're going to stick on her. It's a lovely. She had a lovely spot to hoist, and it's going to make our life much, much easier. <laughs> Mine Warp says, Korea needs to put it in the tree so Hasana can knock it out. Yes, young leopard cubs are quite good at dropping meals out of the trees. Fortunately for Korea, there are not many hyenas around at the moment. So I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, it's going to be such an effort. There we go. Come on, Queenie. Up you go. There we go. <laughs> no, she's decided. Not yet. Is it now? There we go. Look at that. She's she's in that spring position. Her muscles are coiled. go finally well done Karula right right up in there how many meters I get one two seven or eight meters up Now I'm just going to move backwards a little bit so we get that leaf out of the way. Uh, maybe forwards, eh? Back. Back. There we go. Now Joyce is wondering whether putting the carcass in a Tambuiti tree, which we all know is very, very poisonous, will it affect the meat at all. It won't, Joyce. I mean, she's not getting the milky latex. Oh, oh to the bottom of the tree, Jean it looks like, who's that? Hasana looks like he might want to climb up. Oh, knock it down. <laughs> What are you up to, mister? Checking where mom stashed it for later snacking. Although Karula is still feeding, he might not go into the tree while she is. Oh, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> look at him, he's trying to... <laughs> <laughs> Someone spins himself around trying to find the right spot to look at it. And boom, no, he's not going up now. He's going to stare at mom having a feast because she's eating again. Oh, no, give me.
giving herself a clean now. You'll probably find if she lies down or comes down from the tree, her sauna will be up in a flash. And we can hear, we can hear that, Jandre. Very clear, the red-chested cuckoo. Oh, oh, get the sign again. No, he might jump. He's going to jump. No, he's... Now, Anthony was wondering how high can a leopard jump? Anthony, I've seen quarantine probably go oof, a good three or four meters into the air. So I'd probably say that's probably at the, the limit. He was jumping for a flying bird. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Come, Mom, come down. I'm hungry again. Almost can't decide what to do. Oh, looking at his sister. He is an exquisitely beautiful young male leopard. Oh, he's just going to lie down and wait for mom to be finished. So apparently you guys got some incredible screenshots of Karula taking that carcass up the tree. Remember to share them on our Facebook page or on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Oh, here comes Karula. She's coming down. Always amazes me how agile these. Oh, uh, as I say that, she misses a step. Now, what's Hassan going to do? I think he's going to go up. Well, first he's got to stretch, you know, clean those claws. Um, let me go forward a little bit for you, Jean so that leaf is out of the way for that. Oh no, sorry! I saw you as he did it. Oh, there we go. Up he goes. <laughs> How did mom do that? Now what, mister? Oh, you're going to go that way. Mom didn't go that way. Oh, there we go. Well done. He's got there in the end. Oh yeah, let's go back again. Oh, he nearly dropped it already. <laughs> oh, Karula's left and gone back to go bury the stomach. And now let's hope Hosanna doesn't drop it. Why are you moving it? It was in a perfectly good spot, young man. really hungry, he's just more wanting to play with the carcass. Oh, temperature's dropped a bit, so that, sorry, that noise is just my zip going up. Oh! <laughs> he stood on a rotten branch. <laughs> oh, silly you chap. That carcass doesn't look like it's going to stay if you hung it on that tiny little thing, mister. It looks like he's actually managed to drape it over a vine that's growing in the tree. Now, William is wondering why the Queen would bury the stomach. See, he's not that hungry, he just felt like playing, I think. Yes. Uh, well, William, it's to 
try to stop the smell spreading and attracting creatures like hyenas. There we go. Are you eating now or are you still, pl no, still playing? Look at that. Oh, one ear's already been eaten. Oh, careful, don't stand on those dead branches. This is just so special. We're so incredibly privileged to be able to spend the amount of time we do with uh, Karula and her cubs. And it's always that little bit sweeter when you track and find her yourself. Oh, it's so, so wonderful that they've moved that carcass out of that very thick area out and put it in this wonderful Tamburji tree. Little Shongile is lying down uh, opposite us. I'm sure. Let's see if we can get a view of her if I go forward. And we'll go have a quick check. There she is. Um, can you get her there, Jandre? Oh, she's right on the ground here. There we go. There she is, just behind that bush there. Fast asleep. I'm gonna go see if Krula is bearing that stomach. It could be quite an interesting thing to look at. So let's go back and have a look. So while we get into that position, let's go back and see what Commander Bond is up to. I'm just still finding flowers, everybody. This one I don't know the name of, and nor does Herbie. It's a lovely yellow flower. It smells like nothing, of course, because it is yellow. And yellow flowers very seldom smell, but this one's a bit of a succulent. If we look at it there, you can see that it's got quite a succulent stem and some succulent leaves, so I'm not sure what it is, but I'm pretty sure that it is an annual, like just about all of these plants. Very few of them perennial plants, so they all spend one season alive. They make a fruit like this one here. There we go. Do you see the fruit there, Brian? Sorry, sorry, sorry. There, do you see the fruit there now? <laughs> And that beautiful fruit will then disappear into the ground and wait for, it might even, it might even come up this season, but most likely wait till the next rainy season. So that's quite interesting. And then if we go over to this thing here, this is going to be a lily of some sort, I'm not sure which, but on it is a very special looking orange beetle. Can you see it, Brian? Okay. Brian says that he can see it, and therefore you can all see it too. And it's sitting on this lily, uh, which will eventually flower into probably something quite pretty. The lilies are about to come out. I've seen my first crinum lily, and they're a beautiful sort of candy pink and red, just in time for Christmas, of course. And then there's one other flower here I just wanted to try and show you. And I don't know what it is, but I think, I'm not mistaken, no, in fact, I'm not sure. Herbie, any idea? Herbie says no idea. It's also quite slimy, like the gusha, which was that first yellow flower we showed you. And this one is not quite in full bloom yet, and maybe when it gets to full bloom, I'll have a better idea of what it is. I'll have to bring the book out here. I've yet to find a book in South Africa that is vaguely competent at showing me exactly what flowers we have here. 
Uh, but, you know, asking around here and there, looking in the books generally gets you the answers that you want. Now, there was one other thing I wanted to show you here. I think it's the... It is the... I I'm just wondering if that isn't a small acacia. I don't think so though. I think this is a devil's thorn plant and what it will do eventually is to produce these very, very nasty little sort of three-pronged thorns. And if you wander about here barefoot, which you shouldn't ever do, well, what happens is that they get stuck in your feet and you yelp and say bad words. Now, on the move, and very competent at getting thorns out of their feet, the Inkohuma Pride, let's go and find out where on earth they're going. Now, we've come across two lionesses. You can see the one here. They've moved away from the Pride, and she's calling frantically. I think I can hear a response from a cub. Now I know how sad this has been. It's been absolutely devastating. I was dreading coming back to the Nkuhumas because it seems as though my floppy-eared girl, my favorite little lion cub, has unfortunately not around. Sorry, let me just speak to my uh, mic, I'm not sure. So, we're gonna try and see if we can follow her and just see where she's going. Let me just turn the radio down. Um, now, we're gonna try and keep up doing a bit of research on this uh, white muscle disease. And there is an opportunity that these cubs can survive, but the problem is, is that they need to suckle. They need to stay hydrated. And it's a pity that this has come at this time because with all this lovely rain we've had, the nutrients in the grass are definitely going to improve. And I suspect that it won't be too long before these Nkuhumas would be actually be up and running and be fit and healthy again. Now, let's see where she's going to go. We'll see, we can't go down into this drainage, but she's calling frantically. Sit here. Now, Aaron, you're wondering how many cubs have we lost. I only counted four cubs. She's going to sit and listen to see if I can hear a response. can definitely hear something down in this drainage responding to it. I think it'll be very soft for you all to hear. Down in this drainage line. And it's very sad because you can see how distressed this female is. She's calling you can see she's definitely not happy about the situation either. And you can see she's also got a bit of a limp. She has an injury on her back just above her tail. Well, I'm not sure what that's from. Maybe from a fight with a Birmingham or an injury when they brought the buffaloes down last night. And it's just heartbreaking. I really don't even know what to say. It's just that it's nature and, and these things do happen. It's quite bizarre. She seems to walk fine and then she seems to struggle a little bit. I don't know if she's maybe got an additional thorn in her foot or something now because she was walking perfectly just a moment ago. Mm. 
But now I'm not hearing any more responses coming out of this drainage system. And she will keep coming back. I think they'll keep coming back until the little ones, these cubs that unfortunately have seemed to have sort of fallen to this drainage system, just until they do slip away permanently. But you can definitely see that they are so distressed at the moment. And it, it, it's, it's so sad, but all we can do is just watch. It wasn't a disease that was brought in from an outside factor. It's just one of those things that when you have droughts, there are obviously repercussions. What we'll probably try and do now is very, very thick down here and it's starting to get dark. So I need to try and get back to the road before darkness falls upon us. And we'll go back to the carcass and have a look at the rest of the pride. And while I do that, I think we'll go back to Brent and see how Karula and her stunning cubs are doing. Well, they're doing splendidly. Hosanna is now starting to feed rather than play with his food. Well, you know, you hope the Inkahumas take a turn soon. Fingers crossed and hopefully we'll know when the necropsy has been done on the cub what is wrong with them. But on happier notes, Look how wonderful and healthy the leopards are looking. Now, Krula went to bury the stomach content. We saw her doing it for a second, but she's gone into a spot where we can't really see her. But a little Shongile is still there. I think we're going to try get down into the drainage where we can maybe see the other leopards a bit better because uh, it's not the best view from up here although it has been the best spot a little bit earlier okay where was it that we dashed up there we go that was quite fun a little bit of technical driving I'm going to do some more technical driving now and of course, avoiding sensitive trees like timbertis and jackalberries, only driving over the fast growing ones. Now, this timberti is going to be a little bit harder to avoid. I'm trying to think how we're going to do this. There we go. You got it, Jandre? There we go. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, it is getting quite dark, so we're not going to stay here for too much longer. But fortunately, with this camera, we, Jandre might be able to work some magic. Um, what do you think, Jandre? Go for Shungile, rather. It's going to be quite difficult to get Hasana because of the light. He's in a bit of a funny spot. He's still more playing than eating, but he has put that carcass in a precarious spot that it could fall quite easily. Luckily, no hyenas are waiting at the bottom. Okay, well, let's go look at Shongile. I think she's going to be in a slightly better spot for us in this low light. <laughs> You're going to fall again, you silly. That's a dead branch. <laughs> Sitting on a dead branch. Uh, and I know a lot of you... Oh, oh. And Teresa and many, many others are wondering whether the leopards could fall for the same disease. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, is, it is possible, but highly unlikely. 
and it's going to be interesting to find out what it is. But at the moment, these creatures look in perfect condition. Keep standing on dead branches, mister. And there goes a branch. <laughs> <laughs> Head butting that irritating branch out of the way. It was quite an aggressive little headbutt there by the prince. Don't drop it now. It's always just wonderful to sit and watch leopards. Oh, that's the dead branch, don't. <laughs> He's standing on it again. It's almost like he wants to take a tumble. Oof. Living danger dangerously, mister. Now, We've seen them go up the tree, and we saw Karula come down the tree, and Kristen in North Carolina is wondering how they do. Well, they'll actually climb down forwards, and then they'll jump at the last little bit. Uh, but then it's possible that they can, would survive a jump from that high, but normally they come down the tree forwards, and then just the last sort of meter or two, they'll leap. Oh, he's back up to nonsense. Oh, well, speaking about, here we go. Kristen, it looks like he might go down the tree to show you. Now, have a look. Oh, is he going to change his mind? Mm, I think he's coming down. There we go. So see how he comes down facing forwards? <laughs> is he stuck? <laughs> that is, yeah, there we go. <laughs> And here you go. Oh, oh, oh. And there we go. The last little bit. The last meter or so. He'll probably jump. Whoop. Just like that. Well, there you go, Kristen. That answers your question perfectly, how they come down. Right, there we go. Well, it is getting dark, and we are in a very difficult area, so Jandre and I are going to start moving out, and while we do that, Commander Bond has some final words for you. Well, I don't have so many final words as I do so many final animals. A Nyala, whole lot of Nyalas, whole lot of Impala, and we were rather hoping that there might be a little baby Impala. Still none of us have seen one around here. Plentiful down in the south of the Sabi Sand, apparently, but none up here. Now, you will also possibly be interested to know that the woodland kingfisher not the Woodlands Kingfisher, Woodland Kingfisher, was reported on Mala Mala today. Chip, brrr, has not arrived back here yet. We're not really sure why. Hopefully soon they will be here filling the air with their cheerful mating calls. Let's have one last look. We're just going to walk slowly along the road here. It is getting dark, which means we're going to get back to camp. We're only about two minutes out. But let's walk slowly along here and see if there isn't a lamb in amongst this herd. Brian, do you see any lambs? No. Oh, no. I wonder why we do not have any lambs with us, Brian. It's quite late this year, I think. Yeah. And certainly the woodland kingfisher is now late. As of yesterday. Yesterday was the 16th, wasn't it? Very nice, Brian. You're holding that camera extremely steadily. I'm trying to. Mm. Wednesday was the 16th, and that's when, of course, the woodland kingfisher arrived last year. But he has not come this year at the same time. 
and I do not see any little impala lambs. Now, if they were just recently born, of course, they would most likely be lying up in some thick bush, and then they would wait until they're sort of steady on their feet. It wouldn't be long, it would probably be about an hour or two before they'd start moving around with the herd, unsteadily at first, and by the time they were 24 hours old, if they'd managed to get that age, uh, then they'd be fine to move with the herd and they'd be very sprightly and very fast. All right, everybody, that's going to be it from us on the bush walk here. Um, Brian, thank you for your efforts. Well done, well done to the thumb. And a big thank you to Herbert on foot. Thank you, Herbert. Thank you. <laughs> we'll hand you back to Taylor and her lions, and we'll see you in the morning at 0500. Bye-bye. <laughs>
larger breeds of dogs. And and it's just, it's got to do with them feeding on this poor quality of buffalo too. And then of course, but the cubs are affected by it the worst because they're not just feeding on the, the carcass, they're also where maybe they wouldn't get the good nutrients from. Normally they'd get the good nutrients from mom's milk. Now they're not even getting that. It is so tough, but this is nature. This is all we can do. And I keep saying it over and over again. Brent is gonna say it over and over again. James and Jamie is we can just sit here and watch. This is not a disease that was brought in by humans or a dog or anything like that. It's no outside of, of factors. This has come around and it's pure, it's natural. It's a repercussion of the drought. And I'm gonna reiterate it again, just in case somebody has maybe just tuned in for the first time. The diseases are around to keep the carnivores in check. The drought keeps the herbivores in check. It lowers the populations. It makes sure that they don't get out of hand. And some way you need to do the same thing with the predators. And it's just sad that it's all just happened at this time. But we'll see. The clouds are big and they're forming in the distance. I think the rainy season is on its way. Now, Marsha, you've asked a very interesting question. You've said, are we certain that the Styx cubs died of mange or could they have possibly also died of this white muscle disease? There's definitely a possibility. However, just from what we saw, it looked as though the mange completely took over those little cubs. But maybe it was a combination of the two. Maybe the mange really came through and sort of uh, became a lot stronger than what it was because of the white muscle disease sort of attacking the muscles and their bodies not being able to fight it and do anything about it. That's definitely a possibility. But unfortunately, we can't tell for certain unless we do a blood test. Now we have taken one of the cubs that has passed away. I do want to let you know this, and we are going to send the cub off to Onestapuert, which is the, the biggest veterinary sort of uh, university that we have in South Africa that's located in, uh, in Pretoria. We're gonna send it off and we're gonna see what they say. Obviously we've heard that this is what this is. The vets have seen it already happening this year, and hopefully they'll be able to confirm it. But we'll let you know as soon as we know the exact results though. But from what we've told them, They've said it sounds very much like what they've already tested. Now, it's getting very dark. I can't unfortunately put any lights on these lions because of the cubs in and amongst that male feeding. I don't want to, of course, um, blind the cubs and cause any attraction, especially with there's a carcass around here and with the lions seemingly being a little bit on the weakened side if a hyena comes through, we don't want to entice that. So it's one, no, I thought it was a hyena, it's not a hyena. We're actually gonna have to leave these lions now and let them carry on. But what we will do is I'm sure first thing in the morning, we'll come around here and have a look and have an investigation. Now, I suspect, that that one lioness has maybe gone for a drink so maybe we'll actually quickly go and check shortcut the, uh, the pan on Gallego shortcut let's go have a quick look there maybe she's still there because it wasn't just one lioness there were two lionesses that moved off let me just leave this site let me just tell everyone that we're gonna leave it Ooh. right I'm gonna do them and do a bit of chatting on the game drive radio oh and the clouds are coming over quite thick but let's go see what Brent is up to We're in search of nocturnal creatures. Bush babies, genets, civets, servals, who knows what might be around the next corner. The one thing I haven't seen in some time is the white-tailed mongoose. And I'm hoping maybe on quarantine we might find one of the pair that does reside there. They tend to get up quite late, but because it's cool this evening and there's bugs about, so foraging will be a little bit easier, they might get moving a little earlier. Now, 
Of course, I know everyone is very worried about the Nkuma cubs and the possibility of Karula's cubs also coming down with disease. And so they think it's white muscle disease and they don't know for sure. But uh, if it was that, if it is that, Karula's cubs would have already shown symptoms because it is from the mother's milk. And uh, they've been weaned for quite some time already so I think it's very unlikely that if it is white muscle disease it will ever spread onto Karula's cubs as again as much as we speculate uh, I really really caution against it uh, and the only way is going to actually get the facts from the vets and and then 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 a decision and a plan or, uh, can be made now I know a lot of people are probably not going to want to hear this but if it is a non-human caused disease and it is a natural disease that occurs in lions in the wild, uh, the policy will be hands off still. It will not get, get involved. Uh, it is not our place to, to manage the lion numbers and, and things like that. Nature in an open system and a healthy system like this takes care of itself. So as difficult as it will be if it comes back that it's not a a disease that's been brought in by human influence or domestic dogs for example um, nothing will be done and even even if the whole pride uh, does eventually die uh, that is nature it is what happens out here and sometimes it's very sad for us and difficult for us to comprehend and we have to trust mother nature that she knows what she's doing Now, a lot of all these sort of problems are born from this drought that we've had. And I mean, the worst drought in recorded history. Now, Shamrock's wondering, will there be any long-term effects on the animals, uh, such as malnutrition and that? But Shamrock, strangely enough, the animals that live through the drought uh, and uh, the diseases and stuff like that come back twice as strong. I mean, they're, they're, they're sitting with the best genetic stock. So generally what happens is you actually now for the next couple of months we're still going to be seeing some effects animals that might still be quite weak from it but after the next rainy season uh, you can normally see quite a, a little a little population explosion with very good genes so those animals tend to survive now a great example of this is um the the last big drought was in the in the early 90s and uh, the kruger national park had about, I think it was 20 or 25,000 buffalo in the Greater Kruger. Now, they got really, really whacked in that in that drought. Far, the buffalo took far more of a beating in that drought than they did in this drought. And uh, I think the, the whole population of the Kruger dropped down to just below 10,000 buffalo. So that was the drought ended in, in 1994 or 93. And now we jump forward just over 20 years. Uh, to 2016 before the drought the buffalo population of the Kruger Park was 49,000 so double what it was so their, their droughts do weed out the weak and uh, promote good healthy genetic lines in, in most of the animals so it is it is very sad to witness and it's difficult to witness but uh, there's method to the mother nature's madness Now, chatting about the end of the drought and the rains, and we, I'm just going to stop in a second. We've got some spectacularly dark storm clouds are brewing to uh, the west and south. And Elena's wondering how much rain fall on average do we get? So, in this part of the Sabi Sands, we get on average about 350 mils a year. Um, there we go, look at that. You can see there's some dark, stormy skies are brewing winds picking up a little bit so who knows we might get some rain overnight we did hear thunder a bit earlier 
And if we pan across to the left, you'll see how dark it gets. Dum dum dum. Ominous skies. Very pretty though. Okay, so there we are. Then about 350 mils. Um, last year we got about a third of of that, and uh, we are probably not going. To, we're probably going to have a normal rain 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 cycle. So anywhere from 300 to 350 mils this year. But uh, you always got to be careful predicting the weather, because it sometimes kicks you in the teeth. Now a woodlands kingfisher has been seen just below our southern boundary but we haven't seen one here yet I thought I heard one today but it was quite windy so who knows maybe on tomorrow's sunrise safari the first woodlands of, uh, of the year for safari live might be ch -ch chirring from the top of a tree oh, elephants push down a tree onto the road round around now this is always a good little spot around here for bush babies so that's one of the reasons I've come to the far western edge of quarantine it's one of my favorite bush baby haunts at this time of the evening What a wonderful drive it's been so far. Lions, leopards. Debbie is wondering what my favorite summer arrival is. Is it the baby impala? Is it the kingfishers? Um, or is it something else? Oof. Debbie, that's a difficult one. I think I've got two. I would probably say baby warthogs. <laughs> they are just two. There's no other word to describe them, but baby warthogs. Oh, sorry, waterbuck. Um, and I don't know, even know if we've seen this particular bird. Where's my thingy, my bob? Uh, on, on the live drives, but I see it in the summer months when they arrive at uh, my parents' house in the reserve. Now, where have I put it? I've lost it. Ah, there it is. Um, and uh, it is it is a bird, but it, it is it's not a common one. But for some reason, my parents' house, I sw I've seen some really incredible sightings of uh, of this bird and eating. You're not going to believe it, chameleons. So let me just find out where it is. Sorry about this. Here we go. A B C D. Here we go. Is it gone now? Ah, there we are. Let's get into the right part of the world. Uh, how many birds? I love birds so much. Um, I do enjoy a good birding day, which I actually planned to try have this afternoon, but the, the windy weather isn't the best. Sorry, I'm trying to get there. There it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. That is it. The African cuckoo hawk. Isn't that a cool looking bird? And one of its favorite foods is chameleons. Isn't that? Oh, swipe, Jean Red, warn you there. There we go. That's what he looks like when he's sitting. And when he's flying. I'm gonna try to see if there's a. So there we go. This is where they occur, but that's only uh, if you can see here that during those months. There's a picture of one. Oh, I do like them so much. They're, they're not a very easy bird to see, and not a bird you see too often. But just for some reason, that reserve where my parents live, I, I've had incredible sightings of these birds hunting chameleons in the day. The African cuckoo hawk. There we go. And that's probably one of your, uh, that and baby warthogs are my two favorite summer arrivals in the low felt. So while we sneak past with our lights off, past these waterbuck, and we don't want to blind them now, do we? Let's go see what Taylor is doing in the dark. 
We are looking for chameleons because I have yet to see my first chameleon of the season, but I think it could be a bit chilly for them this evening. Now, I believe Brent has told you about some of his favorite summer arrivals, and I'm envious that he's chosen little warthog piglets because they are so uh, adorable, and I believe that Debbie was the one who fed the question through, so thank you, Debbie. So I love the warthog piglets too. What's not to love about a warthog, especially a baby? And of course the African cuckoo hawk. Now that's amazing. I've only ever seen one of them before and that was down in the Eastern Cape and that was quite a treat. Now my favorite summer arrival. Hmm, it's a tough one. I don't just have one, funny enough. I think out of the birds, my favorite must be the, the cuckoo shrikes, the black cuckoo shrikes, which we've been seeing. I absolutely love them. So that's really nice. Like I said, it brings back memories from, from the Eastern Cape and I haven't seen them for about a year and a half. So that was really wonderful. I just love everything about summer. The green grass and the green leaves that come with it, all the reptiles that come out, the ones that we haven't seen for, for quite some time. And then of course, all the lovely insects too. And I just feel as though happy, summer is just a happier month, especially for the herbivores. So it's really nice to, to see them sort of bounding around. And well, if they, have, if they really could have a grin on the face, I think that they would be smiling that there's an abundance of food around. So that's, that's sort of my favorite thing about summer. I haven't, I haven't got one specific thing. And of course the warm weather and the days at the beach that's also quite nice and we just come up on the dam wall again I just wanted to have a look in this drainage to see if we can see anything but nope nothing down in here and nothing interesting at the watering hole just yet can hear a couple of uh, it might be a bit windy for you but there are a couple of water thick knees calling in the distance but let's go back on to around to the I'm going to head around. Maybe we'll see if we can hear them again. They have an interesting call. I quite enjoy the, the water thick knees. And it's not one that you always see around. They're quite elusive and quite shy, those thick knees. Normally it's the spotted that we come across. Oh, and I've got an insect crawling up my legs. That's nice. Oh, oh look who we've got. We're gonna, we won't shine directly on this little chap that we've found. We'll put... There we go. I think oh, we've got two of them. I'm going to switch off and I'm just going to try and light up just in front of them. Can you see those two scrub hairs? Even their ears look like they're blowing in the wind tonight. Now even though the scrub hairs come out at night, I don't want to, to put a spotlight on them because they seem to get disorientated quite quickly. And then they run around and zigzags, almost like a deer in the headlights, or they freeze. So we'd rather just keep it off that end. Well, if there's any jackals or any nighttime critters that are perhaps scouring the plains, they'd probably find them quite quickly. Now, I wouldn't want to be, of course, the ones that cause that. But we can have another look at them. They're moving as slowly for us, which is quite nice. Now, they're just feeding, catching up on some grass. You can see those big ears listening very carefully. And like we've been saying, it's very, very windy at the moment, so they're going to have to be extra careful tonight as to not get caught by an owl even. It's a dark sky, so there's not even a silhouette for them to see anything coming towards them. So even though owls fly quite quietly, they probably wouldn't hear them coming along. Hmm, right, let's see what else we've got. Oh no, Louise just told me that we're coming to the final moments of the show and I was hoping to find a chameleon for you tonight, but tonight is not the night, perhaps in a couple of nights time, but it's been an absolute wonderful afternoon and I'm obviously, we're all devastated by the Nkrumas, but we can just be there and just give, send off positive vibes and just hope that they're able to pull through. Now, from myself and David though, have a lovely day and I hope you keep nice and warm wherever you may be and we'll hopefully catch you on the morning sunrise safari. But let's go back across to Brent and see what he's up to. The search for the elusive white-tailed mongoose is not looking too good at the moment, but it has been an... Oh, it's a car. Absolutely splendid 
having you all here with us on this live African safari in the middle of the African bush. And what a day it's been. I have been absolutely treated to a lovely lion sighting and a lovely leopard sighting. What else did we see? One Stenborg and three Impala. <laughs> uh, but it, it was really nice and always wonderful to be able to track and find your own cat, which is always my favorite thing to do. And look, I see Taylor's lights. Uh, maybe she was also looking for the white-tailed mongoose. I'm gonna let Taylor sneak past us. And uh, I'm gonna just have a chat for the last minute of drive. Uh, there we go. So, and very, very exciting. And of course you had Commander Bond probably being very entertaining. Actually, not probably, definitely being very entertaining as he marched around the African bush. Poor Brian having to keep up with James's frog marching. But I'm sure they had lots of fun. And I know jean and I definitely had a great time, especially for me. The highlight was definitely spending all that time with Queen Karula, Hasana and Shungile. And my personal highlight getting to see them on foot. Karula looking at me. What are you doing here, you silly man? Uh, but it is great. I'm hoping she's still going to be there in the morning. There's quite a bit of food left, not too much. We'll see what happens, but see you in the morning.